Talmud, Masmi Ala Chapter Mission. If the most holy sacrifices were slaughtered on the south side of the altar, the law of sacrilege still applies to them. If they were slaughtered on the south side and their blood received on the north, or slaughtered on the north side and their blood received on the south, or if they were slaughtered by day and their blood sprinkled during the night, or slaughtered during the night and their blood sprinkled by day, or if they were slaughtered with the intention of eating the flesh beyond its proper time or outside its proper place, the law of sacrilege still applies to them. Or Joshua laid down the general rule: whatever has at some time been permitted to the priests does not come under the law of sacrilege, and whatever has at no time been permitted to the priests does come under the law of sacrilege, which is that which has at some time been permitted to the priests' sacrifices which remained overnight or became defiled. Or were taken out of the temple court, which is that which has at no time been permitted to the priest's sacrifices that were slaughtered while purposing an act beyond its proper time or outside its proper place, or the blood of which was received by the unfit and they sprinkled it. Tomorrow it is stated if the most holy sacrifices were slaughtered on the south side, the law of sacrilege still applies to them. Is this not obvious? Should the law of sacrilege cease to apply to them merely because they were slaughtered on the south side? It need be stated, for it might otherwise have entered your mind to say, since Allah said in the name of our Yohanan that sacrifices which died were as far as the law of the Torah rules excluded from the law of sacrilege, so were also most holy sacrifices when slaughtered on the south side considered as if they were strangled. It is therefore made known to us that the instance of the mission is different for sacrifices which died are in no case of any avail. While the south side though it is not the proper place for most holy sacrifices is however the proper place for sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness why was it necessary to enumerate in the mission all those cases it was necessary for if only slaughtered on the south side and their blood received on the north were stated I would argue the law of sacrilege still applies to the sacrifices in this case because the receiving of the blood was after all on the north side but in the case where they were slaughtered on the north side and their blood received on the south since the blood was received on the south side I would say that the law of sacrilege no longer applies to them and if only these first two instances were stated I would argue the law of sacrilege still applies to them because in these cases the sacrifices were at least offered during the day and the day is the proper time for offering in the case however where they were slaughtered by night and there Blood sprinkled during the day since night is not the proper time for offering and the sacrifices were slaughtered by night. I might have thought that the law of sacrilege would no longer apply to them and if slaughtered by night and their blood sprinkled during the day were stated I would argue the law of sacrilege still applies to them because the blood was received during the day in the case however where they were slaughtered during the day and their blood sprinkled by night since it is not the proper time for offering the sacrifices are to be considered as if strangled and the law of sacrilege would accordingly not apply to them therefore also this instance has been made known to us if slaughtered with the intention of eating the flesh beyond its proper time or outside its proper place of what avail are such sacrifices the law of sacrilege still applies to them because the performance of the other acts of offering is yet necessary for rendering the sacrifices. Pickle Talmud, Masmi I will be the following was queried if they were already laid upon the altar must they be brought down Rabbi said even if laid upon the altar they must be brought down Our Joseph said if laid upon the altar they need not be brought down according to the view of our Judah there can be no question that all agree that even if laid upon the altar they must be brought down the dispute arises according to the view of our Simeon our Joseph conforms also here to the view of our Simeon while Rabbi argues our Simeon maintained his view only in regard to offerings the blood of which should be applied below the red line and was applied above or should be applied above the red line and was applied below since they were at any rate slaughtered and their blood was received on the north side in our case however since they were slaughtered on the south side they are to be considered as if they were strangled we have learned if the most holy sacrifices were slaughtered on the south side the law of sacrilege applies to them this is in order on the view of our Joseph but on the view of Rabbi it presents however difficulties Rabbi would reply the law of sacrilege applies is to be understood as enacted by the rabbis only what is the actual difference between its application by law of the Torah and that by enactment of the rabbis when by law of the Torah a fifth of the value misappropriated must be paid when by enactment of the rabbis it is not paid. But is there a law of sacrilege as a rabbinical enactment yes there is for Allah said in the name of our Yohanan that sacrifices which died were as far as the law of the Torah rules excluded from the law of sacrilege from which we may infer that by rule of the Torah only they are excluded from the law of sacrilege by enactment of the rabbis however the law of sacrilege still applies to them in the same way in our mission it is to be interpreted as applying by enactment of the rabbis may we then infer that the statement of Ola in the name of our Yohanan has already been learned in our mission although it has been learned Ola's statement is still necessary for it might otherwise have entered your mind to say in the instance of our mission the rabbis have enacted the application of the law of sacrilege because people do not keep away from those sacrifices but in the case of sacrifices which died since people do keep away from them I might have thought that even as a rabbinical enactment sacrilege does not apply to them therefore Ola has made his view known to us but has not also the case of sacrifices which died been learned already for we have learned if one enjoyed of a sin offering if it was still alive he is not guilty of sacrilege until he has diminished its substance but if it was dead he is guilty of sacrilege as soon as he had benefited from it Ola's statement is still necessary for it might otherwise have entered your mind Talmud, Masmi Ilehu. Say that in the case of the sin offering since it comes for atonement people do not keep away from it but other sacrifices however since they come for atonement people will keep away from them and there was therefore no necessity for the rabbis to enact in regard to them the law of sacrilege therefore Allah has made his view known to us but is it indeed so that the law of sacrilege applies to a sin offering which died has it not been taught sin offerings that are to be left to die in money that is to be thrown into the dead sea must not be enjoyed yet the law of sacrilege does not apply to them you might reply in the case of sin offerings that are to be left to die people keep away from them even while they are still alive which is not so with ordinary sin offerings from which people do not keep away while they are alive our Joseph raised an objection to rabbi by way of inference from one mission to another and again from this to a third we have learned and all of them do not defile the garments worn by him that swallows them and the law of sacrilege still applies to them all except the sin offering of a bird which was offered below the red line after the manner of a sin offering of a bird and under the name of a sin offering and then in connection therewith we have learned the general rule whenever it became disqualified in the sanctuary it does not defile the garments worn by him that swallows it and whenever it became disqualified while not in the sanctuary it defiles the garments worn by him that swallows it and we have furthermore learned whatever became disqualified in the sanctuary need not be removed if already laid upon the altar need not be brought down is this not a refutation of Rabbah's view it is indeed a refutation now the point which had been disputed by Rabbah and our Joseph was a matter of course to our Eliezer for our Eliezer said if a burnt offering which was dedicated to a private high place was brought to be offered inside the sanctuary Talmud, Masmi I will be the sacred precincts exercise on it their retaining power in every respect our elders then submitted the following query of a burnt offering which was dedicated to a private high place and brought inside the sanctuary became disqualified if laid upon the altar must it be brought down may we not infer from the fact that our Eliezer queried only the special case that the other case was a matter of course to him either confirming to the view of Rabbi or to the view of our Joseph no our Eliezer was doubtful even in regard to instances of our mission and he queries the one case as a further step of the other for I could argue on the one hand Rabbi maintained that even when laid upon the altar they must be brought down only when the sacrifices were brought inside the precincts of the temple in conformity with their original provision in which case the departure from the prescribed method of offering rightly disqualified them but where the Sacrifices were brought inside the precincts of the temple against their original provision a departure from the right method of offering he might hold does not disqualify them or I could perhaps argue on the other hand our Joseph maintained that when laid upon the altar they need not be brought down only when the retaining power of the sacred precincts was exercised in conformity with the original provision of the sacrifices but if the sacrifices were brought inside the sacred precincts against their original provision the retaining power of the temple he might hold is not fully effective let this query remain
Separation of a handful of a meal offering corresponds to the slaughtering of an animal offering either upon reply to a statement is to be understood in the following manner the taking of the handful with disqualifying intention is a prohibited act that leads to the offering becoming pickle Talmud, Mas Mi'ala but does it not say since it the handful renders others pickle how much more so should it itself become pickle here too you must understand it as meaning a prohibited act that leads to the offering becoming pickle said Rabbanu to Arashi but did not Ilfa say the dispute is only in regard to two acts of offering namely when he that officiated said I am cutting the first organ while purposing an act beyond the proper time and the second while purposing an act outside the proper place but in regard to one act they all agree that there is here an admixture of unlawful intentions here too you must understand that when the sprinkling takes place it will retrospectively prove whether there was unlawful intention in one act or in two acts of offering if this be so why not say with the then covering too that its disqualification becomes effective with the sprinkling the bread has become sacred means indeed only insofar as it has to be burnt by reason of its disqualification may not the following be cited in support of argital the law of sacrilege applies to pickle always does this not imply even though the blood has been sprinkled and will then offer a support of argital no that is where the blood has not been sprinkled but if the blood has not been sprinkled need it be stated it deals in fact with the case where the blood has been sprinkled but when this has been taught it was in reference to a burnt offering if it refers to a burnt offering is it not obvious since this offering is wholly dedicated to the lord talmud mas mi be talmud mas mi be and moreover it says in the concluding clause if the blood remained overnight although it was still sprinkled the law of sacrilege still applies to the offering this would be right if it related for instance to a sin offering but if it referred to a burnt offering needed at all be stated the concluding clause obviously supports Argidal's view but what about the opening clause as the concluding clause offers a support so will also the opening one but even the concluding clause need not necessarily support Argidal's view and what would be the difference the disqualification of leaving the blood overnight is caused by action and the transgressor is therefore penalized in that the sprinkling has not the effect of exempting the offering from the law of sacrilege but the thought of pickle is not an action and the sprinkling has the effect of exempting the offering from the law of sacrilege but may we not say that the following supports Argidal it was taught the law of sacrilege applies to most holy sacrifices that were rendered pickle now does this not imply even though the blood was sprinkled and will then offer a support of argital no it speaks of a case where the blood was not sprinkled but what would be the case if the blood was sprinkled with the law of sacrilege indeed not apply to it why then state in the concluding clause the law of sacrilege does not apply to sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness which were rendered pickle could the distinction not be made in the opening clause itself in the following manner the law of sacrilege applies to the offering before the blood has been sprinkled but is not applicable after it has been sprinkled the concluding clause undoubtedly supports argital's view shall we say since the concluding clause supports argital so will also the opening one know the latter refers indeed to a case where the blood has not been sprinkled and the reason why the distinction is not made within the opening clause itself is that Statement in the concluding clause on sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness is absolute. The distinction in the opening clause would be informed conditional. Our Joshua laid down the general rule: whatever has at some time been permitted to the priests does not come under the law of sacrilege, and whatever has at no time been permitted to the priests does come under the law of sacrilege, which is that which has at some time been permitted to the priests that which remained overnight or became defiled or was taken out of the temple court, which is that which has at no time been permitted to the priests that which was slaughtered while purposing an act beyond its proper time or outside its proper place, or the blood of which was received by the unfit and they sprinkled. It said Barkaper to Barpado, thou son of my sister, keep in mind what to ask me tomorrow at the schoolhouse. Does permitted to the priests mean permitted through slaughtering Talmud, Masmi Ila, or permitted? For sprinkling or permitted for consumption, Hezekiah said it means permitted at the time of slaughtering our Yohanan said it means permitted for consumption said our Zerah our Mishnah cannot be made to correspond either with the view of Hezekiah or that of our Yohanan for we have learned that which remained overnight or became DEFLLED or was taken out of the temple court now does this not mean that the blood remained overnight and yet it states that the law of sacrilege does not apply a statement. Which proves that permitted for sprinkling is meant no it means that the flesh remained overnight but the blood had been sprinkled and for this reason it states that the law of sacrilege does not apply we have learned which is that which has at no time been permitted to the priests that which was slaughtered while purposing an act beyond its proper time or outside its proper place or the blood of which was received by the unfit and they sprinkled it how is the last instance to be understood? Shall I say that the blood was received by unfit priests and sprinkled by unfit priests? Why is it necessary to have this twofold disqualification? You must then understand it that the blood was received by the unfit and sprinkled by the fit, and it states that in this case the law of sacrilege applies. This would prove that permitted for sprinkling is meant to the sergios of the merchant. You say that a distinction of this character can be made. How would you explain that which we have learned elsewhere? The blood of a disqualified sin offering need not be washed off if splashed upon the cloth, no matter whether the offering had at one time been fit for use and then became disqualified, or had at no time been fit for use, which is that which had at one time been fit for use but became disqualified, that which remained overnight, or became defiled, or was brought outside the temple court, which is that which had at no time been fit for use, that which was slaughtered while purposing. An act beyond the proper time or outside the proper place or the blood of which was received by the unfit and they sprinkled it now how is this to be understood shall I say that the blood was received by the unfit and was sprinkled by the unfit and thus infer that only in this case need the blood not be washed off if however it was received and sprinkled by the fit the blood has to be washed off but this could not be applied here the verse and when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof but not of that which has already been sprinkled you must then say that the text of the mission there is not meant to be taken precisely so as to exclude other instances Talmud Mas me I'll be and likewise here that the text is not to be taken precisely so as to exclude other instances said RC if so why has this loose phrasing been used twice you must therefore indeed say that used in connection with the law of sacrilege is to be taken precisely as excluding other instances Yet your objection that to state this twofold disqualification was unnecessary does not hold good as it is to let us know that an unfit person through his sprinkling renders the blood a residue so that although after the unfit received and sprinkled the blood of fit priest received and sprinkled it again the action of the latter is of no avail why because the blood is considered a residue but did not rush put this forward as a query to our Yohanan does the act of an unfit person render the blood a residue whereupon the latter replied nothing makes the blood a residue save the sprinkling while purposing an act beyond its proper time or outside its proper place because such a sprinkling is in so far of effect as to render the sacrifice acceptable in respect of pickle now does this not exclude the sprinkling by an unfit person no also the sprinkling by the unfit is included but does it not say nothing save this is to be understood in the following Matter there is no disqualification such as to render an offering not acceptable in the case of a congregation sacrifice and yet to make the blood a residue save that caused by the thought of executing an act beyond the proper time or outside the proper place but a defiled priest since he is considered fit in the case of the congregation makes the blood a residue whilst other unfit priests who are not considered fit in the case of the congregation do not make the blood a residue come. And here the law of sacrilege applies to pickle always does this not refer to a case where the blood has not been sprinkled and would then prove that permitted for sprinkling is meant no it refers to a case where the blood has been sprinkled and what is the meaning of always it is to confirm the statement of argital for argital said in the name of rab the sprinkling of the blood of a sacrifice rendered pickle with slaughtering effects neither exemption from nor inclusion in the law. Of sacrilege Talmud, Mas Mi'ala come and here our Simeon said there is a kind of nuthar that is subject to the law of sacrilege and there is a kind of nuthar that is exempted from the law of sacrilege how is this if the blood was left overnight before sprinkling it is subject to the law of sacrilege if after the sprinkling it is exempted from the law of sacrilege now it states at all events is subject to the law of sacrilege does this not refer to a case where there was still time during the day to sprinkle it so that if he wished he could have perform
Necessary to instance after sprinkling let the distinction be made between before sunset and after sunset this indeed is the way in which the distinction is to be understood this before it was ready for sprinkling and after it was ready for sprinkling come and here the law of sacrilege applies to most holy sacrifices that were rendered pickle now does this not refer to a case where the blood has been sprinkled and would then prove that permitted for consumption is meant no it was not sprinkled but what would be the case if sprinkled with the law of sacrilege indeed not apply to it why then was it necessary to state but if the sacrifices were of a minor degree of holiness they are exempted from the law of sacrilege let the distinction be made between before sprinkling and after sprinkling the distinction made is to be preferred to let no the rule whatsoever has to be brought within the scope of the law of sacrilege can achieve the status only if the sprinkling was According to proper procedure but whatsoever has to cease to be subject to the law of sacrilege can achieve this also by a sprinkling that was not in accordance with the proper procedure Talmud, Masmi I will be mission if the flesh of the most holy sacrifices was taken out of the temple court before the blood was sprinkled our Eliezer says it is still subject to the law of S.A. sacrilege and one does not become guilty in regard to it of transgressing the laws of nut pickle and defilement are akiba. Says ITLS exempted from the law of sacrilege and one can become guilty of transgressing in regard to it the laws of nut pickle and defilement said are akiba. if one set aside his sin offering and it was lost and he set aside another in its stead and afterwards the first was found so that both were designated for slaughtering do you not agree that like as the sprinkling of the blood of the one beast exempts its own flesh from the law of sacrilege so it exempts the flesh of the other. Beast now if the sprinkling of its blood can exempt the flesh of other beasts from the law of sacrilege how much more must it exempt its own flesh if the immurium of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness were taken out of the temple court before the blood was sprinkled our illizer says they are exempted from the law of sacrilege and one does not become guilty in regard to them of transgressing the laws of nut pickle and defilement our akiva says they are subject to the law of sacrilege and one does become guilty of transgressing the laws of nut pickle and defilement tomorrow why was it necessary to state both these instances it was necessary for if the instance of the most holy sacrifices alone was stated I might have said in this case ruled our Eliezer that it is still subject to the law of sacrilege because he held that sprinkling executed according to the proper procedure affects exemption from the law of sacrilege but a sprinkling not according to the proper procedure does not affect exemption but as to affecting the inclusion within the scope of the law of sacrilege he might concede to our akiba that also sprinkling that was not performed in accordance with the proper procedure affects the inclusion within the scope of the law of sacrilege and if the instance of a sacrifice of a minor degree of holiness alone was stated I might have said in regard to sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness only did our akiba rule that the law of sacrilege applies because he held that even sprinkling that was not performed in accordance with the proper procedure has the power of including the flesh within the scope of the law of sacrilege but in regard to most holy sacrifices in which case the sprinkling is to affect the exemption from the law of sacrilege I might say that if not performed in accordance with the proper procedure it does not possess the power of exempting from the law of sacrilege therefore he informs us regarding both instances it was Stated our Yohanan said our Akiva held his view that the sprinkling is of effect in the case of an offering that was taken out only if it was partly taken out of the temple court but if it was wholly taken out our Akiva did not hold this view said our to our Yohanan my friends in the diaspora of Babylon have already taught me Talmud, Masmi I love the disqualifying thought in respect of lost or burnt portions of an offering is of effect now the lost and the burnt no longer exist yet it was taught that a disqualifying thought relating to them is effective but does RC indeed hold this view did not RC ask our Yohanan what is the case if one purpose to sprinkle on the following day blood which has to be poured whereupon our zero replied did you not teach us the mission about allow now this allow because it has no substantial value and unlawful thought relating to it is of no effect the same applies to the blood that is to be poured because it is destined for destruction and Unlawful thought relating to it must be of no effect at all events that which was stated concerning the lost and the burnt offers a difficulty said Rabbah say the disqualifying thought in respect of portions that were about to be lost or burnt said our Papa our Akiva held that sprinkling is effective in respect of offerings that were taken out only if the flesh was taken out but if the blood was taken out the sprinkling is of no effect it was also taught likewise if the slaughtering was performed undefined and the blood was taken out although it was afterwards sprinkled the sprinkling is of no effect most holy sacrifices remain subject to the law of sacrilege and sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness remain exempted from the law of sacrilege said our Akiva to what can this be compared said our Eliezer our Akiva held his view only if both sin offerings were slaughtered simultaneously but if successively our Akiva did not hold his view it has been taught said our Simeon when I Went to Farpage I an old man met me and asked me does our Akiva indeed hold that sprinkling is of effect in the case of an offering that was taken out I said to him yes he does when I came and quoted these words before my colleagues in Galilee they said unto me but is it not disqualified how can the sprinkling be of effect with a disqualified offering when I left and brought up these words before our Akiva himself he said unto me my son do you not hold the same view behold if one set aside his sin offering and it was lost and he set aside another in its stead and afterwards the first was found so that both were designated to be slaughtered both are still subject to the law of sacrilege if they were slaughtered and their respective blood was placed in two separate receptacles the law of sacrilege still applies to both Talmud Masmi I will be if the blood of one of them was sprinkled do you not agree that like as the sprinkling of the blood exempts its flesh from the law of Sacrilege, so it exempts also the flesh of the other beast from the law of sacrilege. Now, if it can save the flesh of another offering from the law of sacrilege, though it is disqualified, how much more must it save its own flesh? Said Reshlakish in the name of Arashai. In exact was the reply that Arakiba gave to that disciple, as it suggests that his instance holds good only if they were slaughtered simultaneously, but not if successively. Now, since the other offering is at all events disqualified, what is the difference between simultaneously and successively? Said Aryohan and Reshlakish, and you do you not make this distinction? Suppose one set apart two guilt offerings for surety, one against the other, and he had them both slaughtered and had the emirim of one of them placed upon the altar before sprinkling. Would you not agree that although those emirim were already placed upon the altar, they have to be brought down now? If your assumption was right that they are considered in such a Case as one offering why have they to be brought down did not rule if the emirim of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness were laid upon the altar before the sprinkling they must not be brought down as they have become the food of the altar thereupon he gave no reply said are you and I have cut off the legs of that child mission the act of sprinkling the blood of most holy sacrifices may have either a lenient or a stringent effect but with sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness it has only a stringent effect how so with most holy sacrifices before the sprinkling the law of sacrilege applies both to the emurlm and to the flesh after the sprinkling it applies to the emurim but not to the flesh in respect of both one is guilty of transgressing the laws of nut pickle and defilement it is thus found that with most holy sacrifices the act of sprinkling has a lenient as well as a stringent effect with sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness it has only a stringent effect how so with sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness before the sprinkling the law of sacrilege applies neither to the emurim nor to the flesh after the sprinkling it applies to the emurlm but not to the flesh in respect of both one is guilty of transgressing the laws of nut pickle and defilement it is thus found that with sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness it has only a stringent effect tomorrow it teaches the law of sacrilege applies not to the flesh which implies that the penalty of sacrilege is not inflicted but the prohibition still remains but why is it not the possession of the priest this is no difficulty since in the opening clause he had to use the phrase the law of sacrilege applies he uses also in the concluding clause the phrase the law of sacrilege applies not but read in the second section of the mission with sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness it has only a stringent effect how so with flesh of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness before the Sprinkling the law of sacrilege applies neither to the emurim nor to the flesh after the sprinkling it applies to the emurim but not to the flesh this implies the
Meir says he renders holy things unclean and terima unfit. The sages say just as he renders unfit liquids and edibles of terima, so he renders unfit sacred liquids and edibles. Said Rabbah on the view of Abbasal, a higher standard has been set with holy things in that the rabbis declared the tibul to be in regard to them unclean in the first degree, and on the view of our Meir, he possesses by rabbinic enactment the same measure of uncleanness as food which is unclean in the second degree. While on the view of the sages, since he has immersed his uncleanness has weakened and he renders things unfit but not unclean once its blood has been sprinkled, the law of sacrilege no longer applies to it. This implies that the law of sacrilege no longer applies, though the prohibition still remains. But why is it not now the possession of the priests? Said our the mission refers to an offering which was taken out of the temple court so that the flesh is indeed not fit for. Consumption and is in accordance with the view of our Akiva who holds that the sprinkling of the blood is of avail with an offering that was taken out of the temple precinct said Arhuna in the name of Rab the draining out of the blood of the sin offering of a bird is not indispensable for Rab learned in our mission when its blood has been sprinkled our son of Akiva in the name of Rab said the draining out of the blood of the sin offering of a bird is indispensable and Rab in fact learned in our mission when its blood has been drained out come and here it is said and the rest of the blood shall be drained at the base of the altar it is a sin offering now on the view of our son of Akiva it is right when it is written and the rest of the blood shall be drained it is a sin offering but according to Arhuna what is the meaning of the est etc as it has been taught in the school of our Ishmael if there remained but then what of the phrase it is a sin offering it refers to the preceding text said our son of Rabba to Arashi if so with the meal offering where it is written and the remainder does it also mean if there remained and should you say indeed so it is surely it has been taught Talmud, Mas me I lay the verse and he shall take thereof his handful of the fine flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof is to exclude the case where there was not the full quantity of fine flour oil and frankincense I will tell you there it is. Written again and the remainder which is superfluous the father of Samuel raised an objection to Arhuna both in the case of the sin offering of a bird and in that of the burnt offering of a bird if the neck was pinched or the blood drained out while purposing an act outside the proper place the offering is invalid but one is not liable to the penalty of extinction if while purposing an act beyond its proper time it is pickled and one is liable to extinction it states at all events the blood. Drained out, he raised this objection and he himself answered it. It is to be understood in a disjunctive sense to revert to the above text. The school of our Ishmael taught if there remained of the blood, but has not the school of our Ishmael taught elsewhere. The remnant is indispensable, and our Papa explained that they differed as to whether the draining out of the blood of a sin offering of a bird was indispensable. There are two contradictory traditions of Tanaim as to what was the view of our Ishmael mission. The law of sacrilege applies to the burnt offering of a bird from the moment of its dedication with the pinching of its neck. It becomes susceptible for unfitness through contact with a tibul or one who still requires atonement, or by remaining overnight once its blood has been drained out, it is subject to the transgression of the laws of pickle, nut, and defilement. And the law of sacrilege applies to it until the ashes have been removed from the altar to the place of. The ashes the law of sacrilege applies to the bullocks which are to be burnt and the goats which are to be burnt from the moment of their dedication once slaughtered they become susceptible for unfitness through contact with the tibul or one who still requires atonement or by remaining overnight once their blood has been sprinkled they are subject to the transgression of the laws of pickle nuthar and defilement and the law of sacrilege applies to them even while they are at the place of the ashes so long as the flesh has not been charred to cinders the law of sacrilege applies to a burnt offering from the moment of its dedication once slaughtered it becomes susceptible for unfitness through contact with the tibul or one who still requires atonement or by remaining overnight once its blood has been sprinkled it is subject to the transgression of the laws of pickle nuthar and defilement the law of sacrilege does not apply to the skin but it applies to the flesh until the Ashes have been removed to the place of the ashes. The law of sacrilege applies to burnt and sin offerings and to peace offerings of the congregation from the moment of their dedication. Once slaughtered, they become susceptible for unfitness through contact with a tibul or one who still requires atonement, or by remaining overnight once their blood has been sprinkled, they are subject to the transgression of the laws of pickle nuthar and defilement. The law of sacrilege then no longer applies to the flesh, but applies to the emirim until the ashes are removed to the place of the ashes. The law of sacrilege applies to the two loaves of bread from the moment of their dedication. Once they have formed a crust in the oven, they are susceptible for unfitness through contact with a tibul or one who still requires atonement, and the festival offerings can then be offered once the blood of the lambs has been sprinkled. The loaves are subject to the transgression of the laws. A pickle nuthar and defilement and the law of sacrilege no longer applies to them. The law of sacrilege applies to the shoe bread from the moment of its dedication. Once it has formed a crust, it becomes susceptible for unfitness through contact with the tibul or one who still requires atonement and may be arranged upon the table of the sanctuary. Once the censers of incense were offered, it is subject to the transgression of the laws of pickle nuthar and defilement and the law of sacrilege. No longer applies to it. The law of sacrilege applies to meal offerings from the moment of their dedication. Once they have become sacred by being put in the vessel of ministry, they become susceptible for unfitness through contact with the tibul or one who still requires atonement or by remaining overnight. Once the handful has been offered, they are subject to the transgression of the law of pickle nuthar and defilement and the law of sacrilege no longer applies to the remnant, but it applies. To the handful until its ashes have been removed to the place of the ashes Gemara it was stated if one has made use of the ashes of the tapwa which was on the altar Rav says he has not transgressed the law of sacrilege and our Yohanan says he has transgressed both agree that before the separation of the ashes the law of sacrilege still applies to them they differ as to what is the case after the separation of the ashes Rav says the law of sacrilege no longer applies to them since the prescribed ceremony has already been performed with them but our Yohanan holds since it is written and the priest shall put on his linen garments as priestly garments are necessary it proves that they, the ashes still maintain their sacredness we have learned the law of sacrilege applies until the ashes have been removed to the place of the ashes this presents a difficulty on the view of Rav Rav would tell you the meaning is until it is fit for removal to the place of the ashes Talmud Mas B. The following objection was raised. We have learned, and if any of them burst off from the altar, they need not be replaced. Similarly, if a coal burst off from the altar, it need not be replaced. It appears that if, however, the coal burst off from the fire but still remained on the altar, it has to be replaced upon the fire. This is right according to the view of our Yohanan, but presents a difficulty on the view of Rab Rab would reply. It is different with coal as it is still substance. Some there are who say the objection was raised in the other direction. It appears that coal only has to be replaced because it is of substance, but ashes that are not of substance, though still upon the altar, are not subject to the law of sacrilege. This would be right according to Rab, but presents a difficulty on the view of our Yohanan. Our Yohanan would reply, This ruling applies to ashes as well, and the reason why coal has been instanced is to let us know even in the case of coal that is of substance. If it burst off from the altar, it must not be replaced. It was stated if one enjoyed of the flesh of most holy sacrifices before the sprinkling of the blood or of the emirum of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness after the sprinkling of the blood, Rab says the value of that which he enjoyed must be restored to the net of a fund. Levi says he shall buy something which is holy for the altar. It was taught in confirmation of Levi's view to which fund goes this repayment for the sacrilege. Those that were permitted to argue before the sages say he shall buy something which is holy for the altar, which is an incense. It was taught in confirmation of Rab's view if one has enjoyed of the money destined for his sin or guilt offering. If his sin offering has not been offered yet, he shall add a fifth and offer for the whole sum his sin offering. Similarly, if his guilt offering has not been offered, the money is to be taken to the Dead Sea. Similarly, if his guilt offering has already been offered it shall be restored to the net of a fund if one had enjoyed of most holy sacrifices before the sprinkling of the blood or of the emirum of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness after the sprinkling of the blood the value of that which he has enjoyed goes to the net of a fund if one has enjoyed of any kind of offerings
Distinction made as to whether the owner has been atoned or not. The former clause is in accordance with the view of our Simeon who holds every sin offering whose owner has already been atoned is left to die Talmud. Mas Mi'ilah while the latter clause is in accordance with the sages said Arabi Habi Kathal to our Ashi indeed the said Abay the former clause reflects our Simeon's view and the latter that of the sages said Rabbi all agree that if he enjoyed of the flesh of most holy sacrifices which was defiled or of the immurum of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness after they had been placed upon the altar he is free from the payment of indemnity is this not obvious for what loss did he cause I might have thought that since the flesh of most holy sacrifices became defiled there is still attached to it the duty of being burnt by the priests and with the immurum of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness placed on the altar fire the duty of turning it over by the poker we are therefore informed that he is free said Rabbah the statement if the sin offering has already been offered the money is to be taken to the dead sea holds good only in the case where he became aware of his transgression of the law of sacrilege before this atonement but if after his atonement it goes to the net of a fund why because one may not at the outset set aside holy things for destruction mission the law of sacrilege applies to the handful of a meal offering the frank incense the Incense the meal offering of the priest, the meal offering of the anointed high priest, and the meal offering that is accompanied by a libation from the moment of their dedication. Once they have become sacred by being put in the vessel of ministry, they become susceptible for unfitness through contact with a tibul yom or one who still requires atonement, or by remaining overnight, and they are subject to the transgression of the laws of nahar and defilement. But the law of pickle does not apply to them. This is the general rule: whatsoever has that which renders it permissible for the altar or for the use of the peerless tie is not subject to the laws of pickle nahar and defilement until that act has been performed, and whatsoever has not that which renders it permissible becomes subject to the laws of nahar and defilement as soon as it has become sacred by being put in the vessel of ministry. But the law of pickle does not apply to it. Talmud, Mas mi be gemara. Once do we? Know this for our rabbis taught I might have thought that only for things that have that which renders them permissible is one culpable for transgressing the law of defilement for this would be the logical deduction since pickle which requires only one awareness of transgression whose sacrifice of atonement is fixed and allows of no exception for the congregation yet it applies to things only that have that which renders them permissible the much more so must uncleanness which requires a twofold awareness of transgression whose sacrifice of atonement can be of a higher or lesser value and allows of an exception for the congregation apply only to things that have that which renders them permissible the text therefore states say unto them whosoever he be of all your seed throughout your generations that approaches unto the holy things which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him that soul shall be cut off from before me scripture deals with all kinds of holy things, but I might have thought that in the case of things that have other things that render them permissible, the law of defilement would apply at once. Therefore, it states who approaches, which is to be expounded after the way of our Eliezer, who said, Is it possible that one is liable to the law of defilement merely by touching the flesh? You must then understand it in the following manner. Whatsoever has that which renders it permissible is not subject to the laws of pickle, nut, and defilement until that which renders it permissible has been performed, and whatsoever has not that which renders it permissible is liable to those laws only when they have become sacred by being put in the vessel of ministry. Chapteriii, mission of the young of a sin offering, the substitute of a sin offering, and a sin offering whose owner has led or left to die that which passed the age limit of one year or was lost and then found with a blemish if after the owner. Has been atoned, it is left to die, it cannot affect a substitute, and though one may not derive any benefit from it, it is not subject to the law of sacrilege. Talmud, Mas Mi'ala, if before the owner had been atoned, it shall go to pasture until it becomes unfit for sacrifice, then it shall be sold, and for the equivalent, another sacrifice shall be bought, it can affect a substitute, and is subject to the law of sacrilege. Gemara, why this difference in that no distinction is made in the first clause, while in the concluding a distinction is made in the first clause, the ruling is absolute, in the concluding it is not, but has not this mission been taught already in connection with exchanges there, it has been taught for the sake of its reference to the law of exchanges here by reason of its reference to the law of sacrilege. Mission, if one has set aside money for his Nazi right offerings, it may not be used, but the law of sacrilege does not apply to it, as it may all be used for the peace. Offering if he died and left money for his NA's Lord offerings if unspecified it shall go to the net of a fund if specified the money designated for the sin offerings shall be taken to the salt dead sea it may not be used though the law of sacrilege does not apply to it with the money designated for a burnt offering they shall bring a burnt offering the law of sacrilege applies to it with the money designated for the peace offering they shall bring a peace offering and it has to be consumed within a day but requires no bread offering Amara Resh Lakish why does not the Mishnah teach also the following case if one has set aside monies for burnt offerings they may not be used but the law of sacrilege does not apply to them because he might buy with them turtle doves which have not reached the prescribed age or pigeons which have passed the prescribed age said Rabbah in our case the Torah rules that for the unspecified money also a peace offering shall be purchased but does the Torah ever rule that turtle doves which have not reached the right age shall be offered? Are they not indeed unfit for the altar mission? Our Simeon says the law relating to blood is lenient at the beginning of the offering ceremony and stringent at the end, and relating to libations is stringent at the beginning and lenient at the end. Blood is exempted from the law of sacrilege at the beginning, but is subject to it after it has flowed away to the brook. Kidron libations are subject to the law of sacrilege at the beginning, but are exempted from it after they flow down into the shittl and Gemara. Our rabbis taught the law of sacrilege applies to blood. These are the words of our Meir and our Simeon, but the sages say it does not apply. What is the reason of them who hold that it does not apply? Said, well, the scripture says, and I have given it to you, suggesting it shall be yours. The school of our Ishmael taught it reads there to make atonement, meaning I have given it for atonement. But not to make it subject to the law of sacrilege, our Yohanan says scripture says for it is the blood that make the atonement by reason of the life the blood before the act of atonement is to be compared to its status after the act of atonement just as after the act of atonement it is exempted from the law of sacrilege so before the act of atonement it is exempted from the law of sacrilege but why not infer in the other direction just as before the act of atonement the law of sacrilege applies to it so also after the act of atonement the law of sacrilege applies to it is there at all a thing to which the law of sacrilege applies after the prescribed ceremony had been performed therewith but why not Talmud, Mas Mi be one of the ashes removed from the altar which are subject to the law of sacrilege although the prescribed ceremony had been performed therewith the law concerning the removed ashes and that concerning the limbs of the scapegoat constitute two texts of Scripture which teach the same thing and wherever two texts teach the same thing no general rule can be derived from them this would be right according to the view that one may make no use of the limbs of the scapegoat but what would be your argument according to him who holds that one may use them the law concerning the removed ashes and that concerning the garments of the high priest constitute two texts of scripture which teach the same thing and wherever two texts teach the same thing no general rule can be derived from them this would be right according to the rabbis who hold that the text and he shall place them there teaches that they have to be hidden but what would be your argument according to our who holds that a common priest may wear them the law concerning the removed ashes and that concerning the heifer whose neck has been broken constitute two texts of scripture which teach the same thing and from such texts no general rule can be derived but this reply would be right only according to him who indeed holds that one cannot derive a general rule from such laws but what would be your argument according to the view that one can derive a general rule from such laws in this case there are written two limitations excluding other instances here it is written the heifer whose neck has been broken and there it is written and he shall place it by the side of the altar implying that only in these instances does the law of sacrilege apply even after the prescribed ceremony has been performed but not in others lib ones are subject to the law of sacrilege at the beginning etc may we assume that our mission is not in agreement with the view of our Eliezer son of Arzadik for it has been taught our Eliezer son of Arzadik said there was a small passage between the ascent of the altar and the altar on the west side of the altar once every 70 years young priests descended through it and brought up the accumulated congealed wine
The ground I might say it is not necessary to limit the mission to this case for it is considered holy only by rabbinical enactment but does he not adduce the text of biblical text is a mere exegetical support of a rabbinical enactment mission of the ashes of the inner altar and of the wicks of the candlestick may not be used and are not subject to the law of sacrilege if one dedicates ashes they are subject to the law of sacrilege turtle doves which have not reached the right age and pigeons which have exceeded the right age may not be enjoyed they are however not subject to the law of sacrilege Gemara this is right Talmud Mas Mi'ala as far as the other altar is concerned for it is written and he shall place it by the altar but wherefrom do we know this of the ashes of the inner altar said our Eliezer scripture says and he shall take away its crop with the feathers thereof and cast it beside the altar on the east part in the place of the ashes as this has no bearing on the outer altar make it bear on the inner altar but why not say that both passages bear upon the outer altar and it has been repeated in order to fix the precise side for the ashes if so scripture should only say by the altar why add the place of the ashes to suggest that it was the place of the ashes also for the inner altar wherefrom do we know the place for the ashes of the candlestick the expression the ashes is an amplification for it suffice to mention ashes mission are Simeon said turtle doves which have not yet reached the right age are subject to the law of sacrilege while pigeons which have exceeded the right age are not allowed for use but are exempted from the law of sacrilege Gemara it is right according to our Simeon whose reason has been stated in a mission before our Simeon used to say he who uses that which will be fit for offering after a period and has been dedicated before that period has expired has transgressed the prohibitory law though he is not Liable to the penalty of Kareth, but according to the ruling of the rabbis whereby is our case distinguished from that of animal sacrifices which have not reached the required age of eight days, I might reply the sacrifice of a beast that has not reached the required age is to be compared to one with a blemish which can be redeemed, but these bird offerings which a blemish does not disqualify them cannot be redeemed. Ulla said in the name of our Yohan and dedicated animals which have died are according to the Torah exempted from the law of sacrilege. When Ulla said and recited this ruling, our Hista said to him who has ever heard this, your view and the view of our Yohan and your teacher, whether has the sanctity thereof gone, he thereupon replied, Why not ask the same question with relation to our mission where it says turtle doves which have not yet reached the right age and pigeons which have exceeded the right age may not be enjoyed, they are however not subject to the law of sacrilege. Here to ask whether has the sanctity thereof gone nevertheless continued Ula I admit that by rabbinical enactment the law of sacrilege is applicable in these instances but I wish to raise the difficulty is there anything which has been exempted from the law of sacrilege from the beginning and is subject to it afterwards why not is there not the instance of blood which was originally exempted from the law of sacrilege but is subject to it at the end of the offering ceremony for we have learned blood is exempted from the law of sacrilege at the beginning but is subject to it after it has flowed away to the brook Kidron I might reply in that instance the law of sacrilege was applicable at the beginning Talmud Mosmi I will be for Rab said the blood left from a living consecrated animal may not be used and is subject to the law of sacrilege the above text states are who not said in the name of Rab the blood left from a living consecrated animal may not be used and is subject to the law of sacrilege our Hamna raised an objection the milk of consecrated cattle and the eggs of turtle doves may not be used but the law of sacrilege does not apply to them you replied the ruling applies only to blood for one cannot live without blood but not to milk as one can well live without it our measure she raised an objection the manure and excrements that lie in the courtyard of the temple may not be used but are not subject to the law of sacrilege the money thereof paid in compensation goes to the temple treasury now why is this so since here too there is none who exists without some quantity of digested food in its body I might reply how can you compare these two things with one another excrements come from outside the body and when the one quantity of food has been excluded from the body another will be consumed different it is with blood which is part of the body it states may not be used but are subject to the law of sacrilege and the money their up in compensation goes to the temple treasury this offers a support of the rule of our Eliezer for our Eliezer said wherever the sages ruled that a thing is sacred yet not sacred in every respect the money their up in compensation goes to the temple treasury mission of the milk of consecrated animals and the eggs of consecrated turtle doves may not be used but are not subject to the law of sacrilege this holds good only for things dedicated for the altar but as to things dedicated for temple repair if one consecrated e.g. a chicken both it and its eggs are subject to the law of sacrilege or if one dedicated a she ass both it and its milk are subject to the law of sacrilege Gemara does the restriction to things dedicated for temple repair imply that if dedicated to the altar for its value the milk or eggs will be exempted from the law of sacrilege said our papa clause has been omitted in the mission which should read as follows this holds good only for things dedicated themselves for the altar but if their value is dedicated for the altar it is considered as if they have been dedicated for temple repair if one consecrated e.g. a chicken both it and its eggs are subject to the law of sacrilege or if one dedicated a she ass both it and its milk are subject to the law of sacrilege mission whatsoever is fit for the altar Talmud, Mas Mi Ilae and not for temple repair for temple repair and not for the altar neither for the altar nor for temple repair is subject to the law of sacrilege how is this if one consecrated a cistern full of water a mitten full of manure a dovecote full of pigeons a tree laden with fruit a field covered with herbs the law of sacrilege applies to them and to their contents but if one consecrated a cistern and it was later filled with water a mitten and it was later filled with manure a dovecote and it was later filled with pigeons a tree and it afterwards or fruit or a field and it afterwards Produce herbs the law of sacrilege applies to the consecrated objects themselves but not to their contents our Jose said if one consecrated a field or a tree the law of sacrilege applies to them and to their produce for it is the growth of consecrated property the young of cattle set aside as tithe may not suck from such cattle some people used to dedicate on such a condition the young of consecrated cattle may not suck from such cattle some people used to dedicate on such a condition laborers may not enjoy a dry fix dedicated to the temple nor may a cow eat of the vegetable belonging to the temple Gemara it says the young of cattle set aside as tithe may not suck from such cattle wherefrom do we know the said Arahid boy son of Ami it is derived from the firstborn by textual analogy based on the word passing occurring in both texts as the firstborn is subject to the law of sacrilege so also the milk of cattle set aside as tithe is subject to the law of sacrilege too. Milk of consecrated cattle it is derived from the firstborn by textual analogy based on the words his mother occurring in both texts laborers may not enjoy etc. What is the reason said Arahid boy son of Ami scripture says thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn what he treadeth of your own but not of temple property if one threshes his kilo in a field belonging to the temple he is guilty of sacrilege but has it not to be detached from the ground said Rabbin of this. Proves that the dust is beneficial to a kilo in Talmud, Mas Mi Ila Bimisha if the roots of a privately owned tree spread into dedicated ground or those of a tree in dedicated ground spread to private ground they may not be used but the law of sacrilege does not apply to them the water of a well which comes forth in a dedicated field may not be enjoyed though it is not subject to the law of sacrilege when it has left the field it may be enjoyed the water in the golden jar may not be. Use but the law of sacrilege does not apply to it when it has been poured into the flask it becomes subject to the law of sacrilege the willow branch may not be used but is not subject to the law of sacrilege our Eliezer son of Arzadik says the elders were accustomed to use it with their palm tree branches Gemara said Reshlakish the law of sacrilege does not apply to the whole of the contents of the jar but the law of sacrilege applies to the three logs but does it not say in the second clause when it has been poured into the flask it becomes subject to the law of sacrilege from which it follows that in the first clause the law of sacrilege does not apply even with reference to the three logs rather if Reshlakish statement has been made it has been made with reference to the second clause it becomes subject to the law of sacrilege said Reshlakish this holds good only if the flask contained exactly three logs but our Yohanan said it applies to the whole contents are we then to assume that Reshlakish holds that a definite quantity has been prescribed for the water libation but have we not learned our Eliezer said if one offered the water libation of tabernacles
Built on the top of a dedicated tree, but the law of sacrilege does not apply to it. That which is on the top of an ash arrow one flicks it off with a reed. Now does this not deal with the case where the twigs with which the nest was built were broken off by the birds from that tree itself, and yet it rules that he can flick them off with a reed. No, the twigs were brought by the birds from elsewhere. If so, if the tree was dedicated, one may not make use of the nest, and the law of sacrilege does not apply to it. Hence, it must deal with twigs that have, however, grown after the dedication of the tree. And our mission holds that the law of sacrilege does not apply to the growth of dedicated trees. This interpretation seems also logical. For should we say that the twigs were brought from elsewhere, why has a nest to be shaken off with a reed? Let it be simply taken by hand. Set our in the name of our Yohanan. It deals indeed with twigs brought from elsewhere, and the expression. One flicks off refers to the young birds set our Jacob to our Jeremiah the young birds are permitted for use in both instances and the eggs are prohibited for use in both instances set our Ashi if the birds are so young that they require the care of their mother they are considered like eggs mission if the treasurers of the temple bought trees the timber is subject to the law of sacrilege but not the ships and the foliage Gemara set Samuel temple buildings are built first with secular money and then they are dedicated why because he who donates money to the temple fund declares it forth with sacred and that he the treasurer says the sacredness of the money shall be transmitted to the building so that the money may be paid out to the laborers as their wages Talmud Mosmi I will be an objection was raised what was done with the surplus of the frankincense money equivalent to the craftsmen's but if the twigs are from elsewhere there is no ground for such an assumption wages was Set aside from the temple treasury the surplus was then exchanged against this money of the craftsmen handed over to the craftsmen and then purchased from them with money of the new levy now why was this procedure necessary why not exchange the surplus against the building we deal with the case where there was no building but does it not speak of the craftsmen's wages there was no building equivalent to the value of the surplus but does not Samuel hold if consecrated property of the value of Amina has even exchanged against the Peritah the exchange is valid he sanctions such a transaction after it has been done but not at the outset our Papa says this is the reason why the building has to be built with secular money the Torah has not been given to ministering angels he the craftsmen might wish to lie down and would lie down on them and if it was built by consecrated money he would as a result be guilty of sacrilege we have learned if the treasurers of the temple bought Trees the timber is subject to the law of sacrilege but not the chips and the foliage but why should one trespass the law of sacrilege let this too be prepared in a secular state lest one might wish to lie down on them and would as a result be guilty of sacrilege said our papa if the wood is to be used at a later date it would be indeed so our mission refers to wood which is to be used on the same day Talmud, Masmi Ila Achapteriv mission of things dedicated for the altar can combine with one another with regard to the law of sacrilege and to render one culpable for transgressing the laws of pickle nuthar and defilement things dedicated for temple repair can combine with one another things dedicated for the altar can combine with things dedicated for temple repair with regard to the law of sacrilege Gemara since things dedicated for the altar can combine with things dedicated for temple repair although the one is consecrated as such and the other only for its value was it then necessary to mention at all that things dedicated for the altar can combine with others of the same nature since he had to state the addition in this connection and to render one culpable for transgressing the laws of pickle nut and defilement which is inapplicable to things dedicated for temple repair therefore he stated this separately said Arjana it is clear that the law of sacrilege applies only to things dedicated for temple repair and to burnt offerings what is the reason? Scripture says if anyone commits a trespass and sin and error in the holy things of the Lord holy things designated holy for God are subject to the law of sacrilege but as to other things dedicated for the altar of them the priests have a share and the owners have a share we have learned things dedicated for the altar can combine with one another with regard to the law of sacrilege this applies only by rabbinical enactment we have learned the law of sacrilege applies to the most holy. Sacrifices which were slaughtered on the south side it is by rabbinical enactment we have learned if one derived the benefit from a sin offering while it was alive he has not trespassed the law of sacrilege unless he has diminished its substance if while it was dead he is liable even though his benefit was of the smallest value by rabbinical enactment and by biblical law are they indeed exempted has it not been taught rabbi says the expression all fat is the lord's is to include the emirum of sacrifices of a minor degree of holiness with regard to the law of sacrilege by rabbinical enactment but does he adduce a biblical text as proof it is a mere exegetical support of a rabbinical enactment but does not all say in the name of our Yohan and consecrated animals which died are according to biblical law exempted from the law of sacrilege now to what does this refer shall i say to things dedicated for temple repair then the law of sacrilege should apply to them even after they have Die for suppose a man would dedicate a mitten for temple repair with the law of sacrilege not apply to it it must then refer to things dedicated for the altar but then they should not be subject to sacrilege by biblical law rather what the school of Arjani taught was that from that text you can only derive things dedicated for temple repair but things dedicated for the altar you cannot derive from it Talmud, Masmi I will be mission five things in the burnt offering can combine with one. Another the flesh the fat the fine flour the wine and the oil and six in the thank offering the flesh the fat the fine flour the wine the oil and the bread Gemara are who are recited to rob of five things in the world can combine with one another said the latter did you say in the world does not the mission teach of the thank offering and six in the thank offering the flesh the fat the fine flour the wine the oil and the bread the other replied read in the burnt offering we have thus learned here what are Rabbis have taught the flesh of the burnt offering and the sacrificial portions thereof can combine to make up the requisite size of an olive to render one liable for offering them outside the temple court and to render one culpable for transgressing the laws of pickle nut and defilement it speaks of a burnt offering and does apparently not apply to a peace offering this is right as far as offering outside the temple court is concerned for with a burnt offering which is holy. Offered the emurim can be combined but with the flesh of a peace offering it can rightly not be combined but with regard to the transgression of the laws of pickle nut and defilement why should one not be guilty in the case of a peace offering have we not learned all kinds of pickle can combine with one another and all kinds of nut can combine with one another therefore the flesh of the burnt offering and the emurim thereof can combine with one another to make up an olive size so that the blood can be sprinkled on account of them and it represents the opinion of our Joshua for we have learned our Joshua said with all other sacrifices of the Torah the blood can be sprinkled only if an olive size of flesh or an olive size of fat was left if half an olive size of flesh and half an olive size of fat were left the blood cannot be sprinkled with a burnt offering however the blood can be sprinkled even if half an olive size of flesh and half an olive size of fat were left because it is all offered upon the altar and with a meal offering even if it has wholly been preserved the blood cannot be sprinkled how does a meal offering come in said our papa it refers to a meal offering which accompanies a beast sacrifice mission terima terima of the tithe terima of the tithe separated from demi and first fruits can combine with one another to make up the size required to render other things forbidden and to be liable to the payment of a fifth all kinds of pickle can combine with one another and all kinds of nut can combine with one another tomorrow what is the reason that hella and first fruits can combine all these are called by the term terima of hella it reads of the first of your dough you shall set apart terima the first fruits are also called terima for we have learned the expression and the terima of the hand refers to first fruits while the other instances of the mission need no proof mission all kinds of nibbler can combine with one another and all kinds of reptiles can combine with one another tomorrow said rab talmud mosmi i love this has been taught only with reference to defilement but with regard to eating clean animals form one group for themselves and unclean animals another and levi said also in regard to eating do they all combine with one another and rc said clean animals for themselves and unclean for themselves some say he differs from rab while others say he does not differ from him an objection was Raise the flesh of a dead cow and a living camel cannot combine with one another from which it follows that if both however were dead their flesh would combine does this not contradict R.C. no refer thus but if both were alive they could combine and this would be in agreement with our Judas view who holds that the prohibition to eat a limb cut off from a living creature applies also to unclean animals but what would be the case if
Did not our Jose son of Arhanan recite before our Yohanan? It is written, Ye shall therefore separate between the clean beast and the unclean, and between the unclean fowl and the clean, and ye shall not make your souls detestable by beast or by fowl or by anything wherewith the ground teemeth which I have set apart for you to hold. Unclean scripture speaks at the beginning of eating and ends with defilement in order to indicate that as with reference to defilement the lentil is a standard size. So. Also with regard to eating whereupon our Yohanan praised him now does this not contradict Rab's ruling? No, there is no difficulty for the one deals with reptiles while they are dead, the other while they are alive, but said Abbe to him does not Rab refer his statement to the mission and our mission speaks of all reptiles apparently even though they are dead, replied our Joseph. This is your assumption. The fact is that Rab made an independent statement, it said our Yohanan praised him to this. Objection was raised. We have learned there is no standard size for entire limbs of unclean animals, even less than an olive size of nibble and less than a lentil size of a reptile effect defilement. And our Yohanan remarked the penalty of lashes, however, is inflicted only for an olive size. Said Rabbah, Scripture speaks only of those that are separated. Said our Addison of Ahabah to Rabbah, if so, why not draw a distinction also with reference to beasts between those that are separated and those that are not separated? Talmud, Mas Mi'ala, he replied to him, a divine law compares them with reference to the prohibition of you shall not make your souls detestable, but not with regard to standard sizes. Mission of the blood of a reptile and the flesh thereof can combine with one another. Our Joshua laid down the general rule all things that are alike, both in respect of duration of uncleanness and in respect of their standard size can combine with one another. Things, however, that are alike in Respect of duration of Uncle Anes, but not in respect of size, in respect of size, but not in respect of duration of Uncle Anes, or if they are alike, neither in respect of duration of Uncle Anes, nor in respect of size, cannot combine with one another. Gemara said Arhanin in the name of Arzira, and thus said also Rab Judah, only the blood and the flesh of the same reptile can combine with one another. Our Jose son of Arhanan demurred to this the expression that our unclean is to teach us that reptiles can combine one with the other, one reptile with another reptile, or flesh of reptile with blood, whether they are of one denomination or two denominations. Said our Joseph, there is no contradiction, the one ruling refers to a whole creature, the other to a part thereof. Wherefrom do you know to make such distinction from what has been taught if the blood was poured out on a pavement which was a sloping place, and he overshadowed a portion, he remains clean if he overshadowed it. Hold thereof he is unclean now what does a portion mean shall I say a portion of the standard quality of blood but did not our Hannah say in the name of Rabbi if one stirred the exact quantity of a fourth of a log of blood he remained clean you must therefore conclude that a distinction has to be made in the following manner in the one instance the blood came from a whole body and the other from a portion thereof this indeed proves it our Matthew B. Harris once asked our Simeon Biohe in Rome. Wherefrom do we know that the blood of reptiles is unclean he replied because it is written and these are they that are unclean his disciples and said to him the son of Yohe has grown wise said he to them this is a teaching prepared in the mouth of our Eliezer son of our Jose for the government had once issued a decree that Jews might not keep the Sabbath circumcise their children and that they should have intercourse with menstruant women thereupon our Reuben son of Israel, cut his hair in. The Roman fashion and went and sat among them. He said to them, If a man has an enemy, what does he wish him to be poor or rich? They said that he be poor. He said to them, If so, let them do no work on the Sabbath so that they grow poor. They said, He speak rightly, let this decree be annulled. It was indeed annulled. Then he continued, If one has an enemy, what does he wish him to be weak or healthy? They answered, Weak. He said to them, Then let their children be circumcised at the age of eight days and they will be weak. They said, He speak rightly, and it was annulled. Finally, he said to them, If one has an enemy, what does he wish him to multiply or to decrease? They said to him, That he decreases. If so, let them have no intercourse with menstruant women. They said, He speak rightly, and it was annulled. Later, they came to know that he was a Jew, and the decrees were reinstituted. The Jews then conferred as to who should go to Rome to work for the annulment of the decrees. Talmud, Mas Mi'ala. Be let our Simeon Biohe go for he is experienced in miracles and who should accompany him our Eliezer son of our Jose said our Jose to them and were my father he laughed is still alive would you have said to him to give his son for slaughter answered our Simeon were Yohe my father still alive would you have said to him to give his son for slaughter said our Jose to them I shall accompany him for I fear our Simeon may punish him he our Simeon undertook thereupon not to inflict any punishment on him. Notwithstanding this he did punish him for when they were proceeding on the way the following question was raised in their presence wherefrom do we know that the blood of a reptile is unclean our Eliezer son of our Jose curved his mouth and said it is written and these are they that are unclean said our Simeon to him from the undertone of thy utterance one can see that thou art a scholar yet the son shall not return to the father then Ben Timalayan came to meet them he said is it your wish that I Accompany you thereupon our Simeon wept and said the handmaid of my ancestor's house was found worthy of meeting an angel thrice and I not even to meet him once however let the miracle be performed no matter how thereupon he advanced and entered into the emperor's daughter when our Simeon arrived there he called out Ben Timaline leave her Ben Timaline leave her and as he proclaimed this he left her he said to them request whatever you desire they were let into the treasure house to take whatever they chose they found that Bill took it and tore it to pieces it was with reference to this visit that our Eliezer son of our Jose related I saw it in the city of Rome and there were on it several drops of blood Mishnah pickle and Nahar cannot combine with one another because they are of two different denominations reptile and nibble as well as nibble and the flesh of a corpse cannot combine with one another to affect uncle Anas, not even in respect of the more lenient of the two grades of Defilement Gemara said Arjuna in the name of Samuel this has been taught only with reference to the uncleanness of the hands which is only a rabbinical enactment but with regard to the liability attached to eating they can combine with one another for we have learned our Eliezer said it says it shall not be eaten for it is holy with this the writ comes to impose a negative command upon whatever among holy things has become disqualified Mishnah food contaminated through contact with the primary. Deeflement can combine with that contaminated by a secondary defilement to affect Uncle Anas according to the lower degree of deeflement of the two all kinds of unclean food can combine with one another to make up the quantity of half a in order to render the body unfit or to make up the food for two meals to form an ERUB or to make up an eggs bulk to contaminate food or to make up the dry fix bulk in respect of the prohibition to carry forth on the Sabbath and a date's bulk with. Regard to the Day of Atonement, all kinds of drinks can combine with one another to make up the fourth of a log in order to render the body unfit or to make up a mouthful. With regard to the Day of Atonement, Gemara, it has been taught. Our Simeon said, "What is the reason? Because things unclean in the second degree can become unclean in the first degree, but can indeed a thing unclean in the second degree become unclean in the first degree? Surely this is an impossibility." Said Rabbi, "This is what is meant. What caused the object to be rendered unclean in the second degree? Surely it was something unclean in the first degree." Our Ashi said, "Things unclean in the first degree and those unclean in the second degree in relation to uncleanness of the third degree are considered as belonging to one category." Talmud, Mas Mi'ala, Mishnah, Orla, and diverse seeds of the vineyard can combine with one another. Our Simeon says, "They cannot combine." Gemara is a combination at all necessary according to our. Simeon has it not been taught. Our Simeon said the eating even of the smallest quantity of forbidden food makes one liable to the penalty of lashes. Right. Our Simeon says a combination is unnecessary. Mishnah cloth and sacking, sacking and skin, skin and matting can combine with one another. Said our Simeon, what is the reason? Because these are all susceptible to the uncle Anas caused by sitting. Gemara Eitan taught if one trimmed all these and made of the trimmings a cloth to lie upon the standard. Size for contracting defilement is three handbreadth square. If to sit upon one handbreadth square and if to serve as a holder, it contracts defilement. However, small its size. What is the reason of the rule relating to the holder? Said Rishlakish in the name of Arjani because it may be used in connection with weaving in a very It was taught because it can be used by the reapers of fix C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B Mishnah if one derived from consecrated things a benefit of a
and they broke faith wamalu with the god of Talmud, Masmi will be their fathers and went astray after the gods of the peoples of the land. One might assume that the law of sacrilege applied also to a case where one has damaged consecrated things but has derived therefrom no benefit or has derived the benefit but has left the things unimpaired or that it applies to things attached to the ground and in the case of a messenger who has carried out his appointed errand the text therefore. States and sin the term sin is used in connection with terimah and sin is also mentioned in connection with sacrilege just as sin mentioned in connection with terimah refers to a case where there is deterioration as well as benefit and to a case where he who has caused the damages at the same time the person that has derived the benefit and to a case where the deterioration and the benefit are in respect of one and the same object and where the deterioration and the benefit take place. Simultaneously and to things detached from the ground and applies in the case where an agent has executed his appointed errand so also the word sin used in connection with sacrilege refers to a case where there is deterioration as well as benefit where he who has caused the damages at the same time the person that has derived the benefit where the deterioration and the benefit are in respect of one and the same object and where the deterioration and the benefit have taken place. Simultaneously and to things detached from the ground and applies in the case where an agent has executed his appointed errand from this we only derive that the law of sacrilege applies to edibles which are enjoyed once do we know its application to things that do not deteriorate through use and that different portions can combine with one another even after the elapse of a considerable time in the case where he has himself eaten thereof and has given to his fellow to eat thereof or where he has himself made use of it and has given to his fellow to make use of it or where he has himself made use of it and has given to his fellow to eat thereof or where he has himself eaten thereof and has given to his friend to make use thereof the text therefore reads commit a trespass whatever the form may be but why not deduct in the following manner just as with the words sin mentioned in connection with terima the rule is that two separate edibles cannot combine with one another so also with the words sin mentioned in connection with sacrilege two separate meals cannot combine with one another from whence further do we know that edibles can combine if one eats one portion on one day and the other on the following or if even a longer period has elapsed between the two meals the text therefore reads commit a trespass whatever the form may be but why not draw the following comparison just as with the words sin mentioned in connection with terima the deterioration and the enjoyment is simultaneous so also with the word sin used in connection with sacrilege once do we know then that the law of sacrilege applies when one has eaten of consecrated food himself and has given to his fellow to eat even though after an interval of three years the text therefore reads commit a trespass whatever the form may be but why not deduct as follows just as with the word sin mentioned in connection with terima talmud, mas there is no liability except when the food has been transferred from sacred possession into secular ownership so also with the word sin used in connection with sacrilege once do we know that the law of sacrilege applies when consecrated money has been misappropriated and used for other sacred purposes e.g. if he purchased with it the burnt offerings of a zab or a zaba or of a woman after confinement or has paid there with his shekel or if one has offered his sin or guilt offering from sacred money in which case one is Liable to sacrilege at the moment of misappropriation according to our Simeon and at the time of the sprinkling according to our Judah. Once do we know all this? The text reads commit a trespass, whatever the form may be. The master said it is written, if anyone commit a trespass to imply the ordinary man as well as the prince or the anointed priest, what else might one have assumed? Is this not obvious? If anyone is written distinctly, I might have thought the divine law says, and whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, he shall be cut off from among his people, and this one is not a stranger since he had been anointed therewith. Therefore, the amplification mentioned was necessary. The divine law has drawn an analogy between the law of sacrilege on the one hand and the laws concerning the suspected woman idolatry and terima on the other. It is compared to the law concerning the suspected woman, just as the law applies, even though there was no deterioration, so also with consecrated property if a woman has e.g. put a ring on her finger she is guilty of sacrilege and the divine law compared it to the law of idolatry just as the latter applies only when a change has taken place so also in the case of consecrated property one is not guilty when one has chopped wood with an axe belonging to the temple unless it has been impaired the divine law is compared to the law of terima just as in the case of terima the words if one has eaten exclude the one who damages terima so also with consecrated things if one has damaged anything eatable he is exempted from the law of sacrilege for instance if a woman has put a necklace at arcahana to arzibit does gold indeed not deteriorate with it and has the gold of nun's daughter-in-law gone he retorted perhaps the gold was thrown about as your daughter-in-law used to do and besides admitted this is not a case where there is enjoyment and immediate deterioration of the used article but can you Say it will never deteriorate if one has derived the benefit from a sin offering etc. Now consider if this refers to an animal that has no blemish do you not agree that it would be analogous to the case of the golden cup said our papa it refers indeed to one with a blemish Talmud, Masmi I will be mission if one has derived the benefit of half a paratise worth and has impaired the value of the used article by another half a paratise or if one has derived the benefit of a paratise worth from one thing and has diminished another thing by the value of a paratise he is not liable to the law of sacrilege for this law applies only when he benefits a paratise worth and diminishes the value of a paratise the self same thing one does not commit sacrilege with consecrated things with which sacrilege had already been made by another person except with animals and vessels of ministry for instance if one rode on a beast and then came another and rode on it and yet another came and rode on it. All of them are guilty of sacrilege or if one drank from a golden cup and came another and drank and yet another came and drank all of them are guilty of sacrilege or if one plucked of the wool of a sin offering and came another and plucked and yet another came and plucked all of them are guilty of sacrilege Rabbi said whatsoever is unredeemable is subject to the law of sacrilege even after sacrilege has been already committed with it Gemara according to whom is our mission according to our Nehemiah for it has been taught one does not commit sacrilege with things of which sacrilege had been committed already except with animals our Nehemiah says except with animals and vessels of ministry what is the reason of the first tana he bases his opinion upon the fact that animals are mentioned in connection therewith for it is written with the realm of the guilt offering while our Nehemiah argues a minority if it renders things contained therein holy surely it must be holy itself Rabbi said Whatsoever is unredeemable is subject etc. But this is a view of the first tenet they differ with regard to wood for our rabbis taught if a man said I take upon myself to present wood to the temple he may not offer less than two logs rabbi said wood has the status of a sacrifice it requires salt and swinging whereupon robber remarked that according to rabbi an offering of wood requires other wood in addition and our papa remarked that according to rabbi wood requires the taking of a handful are Papa said they differ with regard to unblemished offerings consecrated to the altar which received blemishes and were illegitimately slaughtered. This indeed is confirmed by what has been taught if unblemished offerings dedicated to the altar received blemishes and were illegitimately slaughtered. Rabbi says they have to be buried while the sages hold they shall be redeemed. Mishnah if a man took away a stone or a beam belonging to temple property he is not guilty of sacrilege Talmud. Masmi but if he gave it to his fellow he is guilty of sacrilege but his fellow is not guilty if he built it into his house he is not guilty of sacrilege until he lives beneath it and benefits the equivalence of a paratah if he took a paratah from temple property he has not transgressed the law of sacrilege but as soon as he gave it to his fellow he is guilty of sacrilege while his fellow is not guilty if he gave it to the bathing keeper he is guilty of sacrilege even though he has not bathed for the master can say to him behold the bath is ready for you go in and bathe the portion which a person has eaten himself and that which he has given his neighbor to eat or the portion which he has made use of himself and that which he has given to his neighbor to make use of or the portion which he has eaten himself and that which he has given his neighbor to make use of or the portion which he has made use of himself and that which he has given his neighbor to eat can respectively combine with one another even after the lapse of a considerable time tomorrow what is the difference between himself and the other person said Samuel it refers to the temple treasurer in whose trust these articles were if he built it into his house he is not guilty etc why only when he has lived beneath it should he not be guilty of sacrilege at all events since the beam has been transformed said Rab we suppose he placed
Absolute this one would not be absolute C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V omission if an agent has discharged his appointed errand the employer is guilty of sacrilege but if he has not carried out his appointed errand he himself is guilty of sacrilege for instance if the employer said to him give flesh to the guests and he offered them liver liver and he offered them flesh he himself is guilty of sacrilege if the employer said to him give them one piece each and he said to them take two pieces each while the guests themselves took three pieces each all of them are guilty of essay sirlage talmud masmi ila bigamari who is the tana who holds that any deviation for which the agent would consult the principal is considered something different from the original order said our it is certainly not our akiba for we have learned if one vows to abstain from vegetables he is permitted to eat gourds our akiba holds he is forbidden abe said the mishnah may well agree with our akiba for do you not admit that he should have nevertheless consulted his employer when the scholars passed on these words to Rabbah. He said, Naman, he said, well, who is the tenant who opposes our Akiva? It is Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel, for it has been taught if one vows to abstain from meat, he is prohibited to eat any kind of flesh as well as the head, the legs, the windpipe, the liver, and the heart, and even the flesh of fowls, but he is permitted to eat the flesh of fish and locusts. Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel permits the head, the legs, the windpipe, the liver, and the flesh of fowl, fish, and locusts. Similarly, Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel said that entrails are no flesh, and he who eats them is no man wise, according to the first tenet of the flesh of fowl, different from that of fish and locusts, presumably because people often say, I could not find flesh of the cattle and bought flesh of the fowl instead, but can you not argue? Similarly, people often say, I could not find flesh of the cattle and bought fish instead, said our Papa, we deal with. The case where the vow was made on the day of bloodletting when people do not as a rule eat any fish but then he may not eat fowl either for Samuel said if a man who has let blood eats the flesh of fowl his heart will fly off like a fowl and it has further been taught one should not let blood after a meal of fish fowl and salted meat rather said our papa we deal with the case where the vow was made at a time when his eyes were sore when one does not eat fish if the employer said to him give them one piece each etc may we not infer from this that if an agent adds to his order he still remains an agent in respect of the original commission said our she's hate our mission deals with the case where the agent said to the guests take one piece each at my master's permission and another with my permission Talmud Mas me you might have thought that the agent had thereby cancelled his employer's order and that the employer should therefore be exempted from sacrilege therefore the Mishnah lets us know that this is not the case. Mishnah, if a man said to another person, Get me such a thing from the window or from the chest, and the latter brought it to him from one of these places, even though the employer says, I meant only from this place, and he brought it from another place, the employer is guilty of sacrilege. But if he said to him, Get it from me from the window, and he brought it from the chest or from the chest, and he brought it to him from the window, the agent is guilty of sacrilege. If one has commissioned a deaf mute, an imbecile, or a minor, and they carried out their appointed errand, the employer is guilty. If they did not carry out their appointed errand, the shopkeeper is guilty. If one has commissioned one of sound senses and remembers that the money belongs to temple property before it has come into the possession of the shopkeeper, the shopkeeper will be guilty when he spends it. What shall he do? He shall take a of any object and declare that. The money belonging to temple property wheresoever it may be at that time shall be redeemed with this for consecrated things can be redeemed both with money and with money's worth tomorrow what does he teach us thereby that unexpressed words are of no avail if one has commissioned a deaf mute an imbecile or a minor and they have carried out etc but surely these people are legally not fit to become agents said our Eliezer they have the same status as a vat of olives of which we have learned from what tree do olives become susceptible to defilement when they begin to exude the moisture being one that comes out of them when they are in the vat and not moisture that comes out of them when they are still in the store basket our Yohanan said this is to be compared to that which we have learned if one placed it upon an ape or upon an elephant which carried it to the right quarter and another person was charged to receive it the error of his valid does this not prove that the fact of the execution of the appointed errand alone matters. So in our case, the appointed errand has at any rate been carried out if he has commissioned the same person, etc. Does this apply even though the agent has not remembered against this? The following contradiction is raised if the employer remembered and not the agent. The agent is guilty of sacrilege, but if both remembered, the shopkeeper is guilty. Said Arshis, hey, also our mission has to be understood that both remembered mission. If he gave him a pair of tie said to him, get me for half a pair of lamps and for the other half wicks, and he went and brought for the whole wicks or for the whole lamps. Or if he said to him, get me for the whole lamps or for the whole wicks, and he went and brought for half a pair of lamps and for the other half wicks, they are both exempted from the guilt of sacrilege. But if he said to him, get for half a pair of lamps from one place and for half a pair of wicks from another, and he went and brought the lamps from the place. Where the wicks were to be brought and the wicks from the place where the lamps were to be brought, the agent is guilty if he gave him two paratis and said, Get me for the May citron, and he brought for one paratis citron and for the other a pomegranate. Both have transgressed the law of sacrilege. Our Judah holds that the employer is not guilty for he can argue, I wished for a large citron, and you brought me a small and ugly one. If he gave him a golden dinar and said to him, Get me a shirt. Talmud, Masmi Ilabi, and he brought him for three silver sellers a shirt and for the other three a cloth. Both have transgressed the law of sacrilege. Our Judah holds the employer is not guilty for he can argue, I wished for a big shirt, and you brought me a small and bad one. Gamara, may we infer from this that if a man said to his agent, Go buy for me a core of land, and he bought only a leaf, the acquisition on behalf of the buyer is valid, I might retort our mission refers to a case where the Messenger bought something worth six silver sellers for three but read then the concluding clause our Judah holds the employer is not guilty for he can argue I wished for a big shirt and you brought a small and bad one this is to be understood in the following manner because he can say to him had you spent the whole golden dinar you could have bought something worth two golden dinars this interpretation stands to reason for it says in the concluding section our Judah agrees with reference to pulse for it makes no difference whether you bought pulse for a pair of or for a dinar but how is this if it deals with a place where it is customary to sell cereals by estimate surely then also in the case of pulse when one buys for a wholesaler he buys much cheaper said our papa it refers to a place where it is customary to sell it in kanaz each kanaz for a pair of in which case the price is absolutely fixed mission if one deposited money with a money changer and it was tied up he may not use it and therefore if he did spend it he is guilty of sacrilege if it was loose he may use it and therefore if he spent it he is not guilty of sacrilege if the money was deposited with a private person he may not use it in either case and therefore if he did spend it he is guilty of sacrilege a shopkeeper has the status of a private person says our mayor Arjuna holds he is like a money changer if a paratot belonging to the temple fell into his bag or if he says one paratot in this bag shall be dedicated he is guilty of sacrilege as soon as he spends the first paratot thus the view of our Akiba while the sages hold not before he has spent all the money that was in the bag our Akiba agrees however with the sages that if he said a paratot out of this bag shall be dedicated he is permitted to keep on spending and is liable only when he has spent all that was in the bag tomorrow when Ardimi arrived he said Rush Lakish had questioned Are Yohanan what is the difference between the First clause and the last to this year Yohanan replied in the last clause the man's declaration was this bag should not be spared from a donation to the temple when Rabin arrived he said he raised before him a contradiction between the case of the pocket and that of the oxen for we have learned if one said I dedicate one of my oxen to the temple and he had two oxen the larger one become sacred to this the other replied in the last clause the man's declaration was this bag shall not be spared from a donation to the temple Talmud Masmi Ilai our Papa said he raised before him a contradiction between the case of the bag and that of loss for we have learned if one has bought one from Kutians he shall declare two logs which I shall separate are here with designated as Terimah ten as first tithe and nine as second tithe the latter portion is redeemed and then he may begin to drink it once this is a view of our mayor while our Judah our Jose and our Simeon hold it is prohibited to the sea. Replied in the last clause, the man's declaration was this bag shall not be spared from a donation
Rise early and bathe before the superintendent came at what time did the superintendent come he did not always come at the same time sometimes he came just at cock crow sometimes a little before or a little after the superintendent would come and knock and they would open for him and he would say to them let all who have bathed come and draw lots so they drew lots and one or other was successful tomorrow once in the scripture is this rule derived Abbe replied scripture says and those that were to pitch before the tabernacle eastward before the tent of meeting toward the sun rising were Moses and Aaron and his sons keeping the charge of the sanctuary even the charge for the children of Israel we say yes we have found the basis for the rule of watching and that it requires priests and levites but the mission states the priests keep watch in three places and the levites in twenty one furthermore whereas scripture places priests and levites together the mission places them separately. We reply what it means is this those that were to pitch before the tabernacle eastward before the tent of meeting toward the sun rising were Moses and then Aaron and his sons keeping the charge of the sanctuary Aaron in one place and his sons in two places whence do you learn that priests and levites are separate because it is written those that were to pitch and it is written keeping which implies that those who pitched and those who kept were separate but I may still say that all of those who kept were in one place do not imagine such a thing just as Moses was in one place by himself so Aaron and his sons were each in one place by themselves are as she said this can be learned from the latter part of the verse from the words keeping the charge even the charge Talmud must aim it be in regard to the chamber of Aptonus and the chamber of the spark the question was asked in the academy were they actually upper chambers or were they perhaps simply raised like upper chambers come and here for we have learned in the north was the chamber of the spark built like a veranda and there was an upper chamber on top of it and the priests kept watch above and the levites below and it had a doorway to the non-sacred part whence is this rule derived because our rabbis have taught that the levites may be joined unto the Aaron and minister unto thee the text speaks of thy Aaron's service you say the text speaks of thy service may it not perhaps be of their service when it says and they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tent of meeting this disposes of their service what then do I make of that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee the text must speak of thy service how is this to be carried out the priests watch above and the levites below the fire chamber was vaulted and it was a large room but was there only one watch kept in the fire chamber this is opposed to the following statement there were two gates in the fire chamber one opening onto the hell and one opening onto the Ezra or Judah said in the doorway opening onto the Ezra there was a small wicket through which they used to go in to inspect the Ezra of said since the gates were close to one another one watchman was sufficient as he could glance from one to the other it was surrounded with stone projections what were these projections they were the hewn slabs of the projections by which they used to climb up to the projections but were there any hewn stones there seeing that it is written for the house when it was in building was built of stone made ready etc Abbe replied they were brought ready prepared smaller stones and larger stones as it says stones of ten cubits and stones of eight cubits the elders of the Beth slept there why so why could they not take in beds Abbe replied it would not be respectful to take beds into the temple the priestly novitiates put each his pillow on the ground why are they first called youths and then Talmud, Mos Tamed and Novitiates, they replied that is quite right in the first passage which speaks of those who have not yet become qualified to minister they are called youths in the second clause which speaks of those who have become qualified to minister they are called Novitiates we have learned elsewhere in three places the priests keep watch in the temple in the chamber of Aptonis in the chamber of the spark and in the fire chamber and the levites in twenty one places five at the five gates of the temple mount four at its four corners on the inside five at the five gates of the Ezra and four at its four corners on the outside one in the offering chamber one in the chamber of the veil and one behind the place of the mercy seat on what scriptural text was this practice based Rab Judah from Sura replied according to others it is taught in the very though because it is written eastward were six levites northward four a day southward four a day and for the storehouse as Two and two for the precinct, Parbar westward four at the causeway and two at the precinct, but it was observed that makes twenty-four Abbe replied we must understand thus for the two Ashukim there were two that still leaves twenty-two at the Parbar there was properly only one watchman and the other merely went and sat by him for company because he was far outside what is the meaning of Parbar Rabbi son of Arshila replied it is as if one said towards the outside Clubby Bar if you like I can say that there were really twenty-four places as stated in the text three of them for priests and twenty-one for levites but the text says here levites this is explained by our Joshua Bilevi for our Joshua Bilevi said in twenty-four places priests are called levites and this is one of them is but the priests the levites the sons of Zadok five at the five gates of the temple mount and four at its four corners on the inside five at the five gates of the Ezra and four at its four corners on the Outside why in the case of the temple mount are they placed on the inside and in the case of the Ezra on the outside they replied on the temple mount if the watchman feels tired and wants to sit down he may sit and therefore he is placed on the inside but in the Ezra if he feels tired and wants to sit down he may not sit since a master has said that sitting is not allowed in the Ezra save only to kings of the house of David therefore they are placed on the outside the master said five at the five gates of the Ezra were there then only five gates in the Ezra this seems to contradict the following there were seven gates in the Ezra three on the north three on the south and one on the east Abbe said two of them did not require to be watched Rabbi said there is a difference of ten aim on this point as it has been taught there must not be less than thirteen treasurers attached to the Ezra and seven supervisors are Nathan said there must be not less than thirteen treasurers Corresponding to the thirteen gates, subtract five for the temple mount, and eight are left for the Ezra. We see therefore that there is a tana who says there were eight, and one who says there were seven, and one who says there were five. They did not sleep in their sacred garments, etc. It was sleeping which was forbidden, but they used to walk about in them. You may infer from this that the priestly garments could be made general use of. It was replied, in fact, walking about in them was also forbidden. And the reason why the Mishnah says simply that they did not sleep in them was because it was going to say subsequently, but they take them off and fold them and place them under their heads. Therefore, it says in the first clause also they did not sleep in them. But your explanation itself involves a difficulty. They place them under their heads. This shows that general use may be made of the priestly garments right opposite their heads. Our Papa said we may infer from this that it is allowed. To place tefillin at one side when sleeping and we are not afraid that perhaps one will roll over and fall on them it is reasonable to suppose that what is meant is opposite the head for if you say under the head even granting that they may be made general use of it should still be forbidden on the ground of mixed kinds Talmud, must aim it be this argument is valid for one who says that the girdle of the high priest was not the same as the girdle of the ordinary priest but if one holds that the girdle of the ordinary priest is the same as that of the high priest what is there to say and should you allege that mixed kinds are forbidden only for putting over and putting on but there is no objection to folding them under one has it not been taught neither shall there come upon the garment of two kinds of stuff you may however spread it under you the sages however said that it is forbidden to do this for fear that a thread may wind itself round his body and should you argue that there is something separating behold our Simeon has said in the name of Joshua be Levi who had it from our Jose B. Saul in the name of the holy congregation in Jerusalem that even if there are ten coverings one on top of another and mixed kinds under them it is forbidden to sleep on them we must then conclude that what is meant is opposite the head alternatively I may say that the Mishnah speaks of those garments in which there are no mixed kinds are as she said the priestly garments were hard since are who not the son of our Joshua said this hard fabric made in Narash is permitted come and here it is forbidden to go out into the town in priestly garments but it is permissible to walk about in them in the temple whether at the time of service or otherwise since the priestly garments may be made general use of this is conclusive but not in the town has it not been taught on the 21st of this month is the day of Mount Jerusalem on which it is forbidden to mourn as we find in Yuma in the section. The high priest used to come, etc. Up to if you like, I can say they are fit for the priestly garments, or if you like, I can say when it is a time to act for the Lord, they break thy law if an accident happened to one of them, etc. The supports of you of our Yohanan, who said that the subterranean passage possessed no sanctity, and that a veil carry is sent out of two camps with lights burning on each side, etc. Our Safra was once sitting in a privy when our Abba came and gave a cough, whereupon our
Elsewhere the officer of the Temple Mount used to go round to every watch with torches burning before him and if any watchman did not rise and say Officer Talmud, Mas Tamadei I greet you it was a proof that he was asleep and he would beat him with his stick he was also permitted to burn his clothes the others would say what noise is that in the Ezra it is the cry of a Levi who is being beaten and whose garments are being burnt because he was asleep at his post our Eliezer B. Jacob said once. They found my mother's brother asleep and they burnt his clothes. Our high Abba said when our Yohanan came to this mission, he used to say happy were the former generations who punished even for being overpowered by sleep. How much more than when there was no overpowering as of sleep it has been taught. Rabbi says which is a right way that a man should choose let him love reproof since as long as there is reproof in the world ease of mind comes to the world good and blessing come the world and evil. Departs from the world as it says but to them that are reproved shall come delight and a good blessing shall come upon them. Some say let him have scrupulous honesty as it says my eyes are upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me etc. Our Samuel B. Naman he said in the name of our Jonathan whoever reproves his neighbor for a purely religious motive is deemed worthy to be in the portion of the Holy One. Blessed be he as it says he that rebuked the man is after me not only so but a Thread of favor shall twine about him as it says he shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue if he found it locked he knew etc. Whoever wanted to remove the ashes from the altar etc. This statement contains a contradiction you say first whoever wants to remove the ashes from the altar rises early and bathes before the superintendent comes which would show that the matter does not depend on drawing of lots and then it states let him come and draw lots which shows that it does depend on the casting of lots. Abbe replied there is no contradiction the first statement refers to the period before the regulation the second to the period after the regulation as we have learned at first whoever desired to remove the ashes from the altar used to do so when there were several of them they used to run and go up the ascent and whoever was first in the last four cubits had the privilege if two were level the superintendent said to them put your fingers out they put out the one or two fingers but they did not put out the thumb in the temple it happened once that two were running level up the ascent and one of them pushed the other and he broke his leg and when the Beth didn't saw that they were endangering themselves they ordained that the task of removing the ashes should be assigned only by lot Rabbah said both statements refer to the period after the regulation and what it means is this whoever wanted to come and draw lots used to rise early and bathe before the superintendent came Mishnah he took the key and opened the small door and went from the fire chamber into the Ezra and the priests went in after him carrying two lighted torches they divided into two groups one of which went along the portico to the east while the other went along it to the west they went along INSPACTLNG until they came to the place where the griddle cakes were made there the two groups met and said is it well all is well they then appointed him that made the griddle cakes. To make griddle cakes the one on whom the lot had fallen to clear the ashes from the altar made ready to do so they said to him be careful not to touch any vessel until you have washed your hands and feet from the labor see the fire pan is in the corner between the descent and the altar on the west of the descent no one entered with him nor did he carry any light but he walked by the light of the altar fire no one saw him Talmud, Mas Tamad beat or heard a sound from him until they heard the noise of the wooden machine which Ben Kadden made for hauling up the labor when they said the time has come he washed his hands and feet from the labor then took the silver fire pan and went up to the top of the altar and cleared away the cinders on either side and scooped up the ashes in the center he then descended and when he reached the pavement he turned his face to the north and went along the east side of the descent for about ten cubits and he then made a heap of the cinders on the pavement three and breadths away from the ascent in the place where they used to put the crop of the birds and the ashes from the inner altar and the ash from the candlestick tomorrow but were their porticos in the Ezra has it not been taught our Eliezer B. Jacob says whence do we learn that porticos of wood are not made in the Ezra because it says thou shalt not plant thee an Asherah or any kind of tree beside the altar of the Lord thy God the meaning of which is this thou shalt not plant thee an Asherah nor shalt thou plant thee any kind of tree beside the altar of the Lord thy God our historian replied it is permitted with porticos of stone they went along inspecting to make griddle cakes this would imply that the griddle cakes were the first thing offered but it has been taught whence do we know that nothing preceded the regular morning offering it says and he shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it and Rabbi said the burnt offering implies that it goes up first Rab Judah replied he is appointed to prepare hot water for the soaking C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I -I Mishnah when his brethren saw that he had descended from the ascent they came running and hastened to wash their hands and feet in the labor they then to okay the shovels and the forks and went up to the top of the altar such limbs and pieces of fat as had not been consumed since the evening they removed to the sides of the altar if there was not room on the sides they arranged them on the surround and on the ascent they then began to throw the ashes onto the heap as heap was in the middle of the altar and sometimes there was as much as 300 core on it on festivals they did not use to clear away the ash because it was reckoned an ornament to the altar it never happened at Talmud. Mas Tamad the priest was neglectful in taking out the ashes they then began to take up the logs to lay the fire where all kinds of wood suitable for the fire all kinds of wood were suitable for the fire except vine and olive. Would owe what they mostly used however were boughs of fig trees and of nut trees and of oil trees he then arranged the great pile on the east side of the altar with its open slow on the east while the inner ends of the selected logs touched the central heap spaces were left between the logs in which they kindled the brushwood they picked out from there some specially good fig tree branches and with these he laid a second fire for the incense near the southwestern corner some four cubits to the north of it using as much wood as he judged sufficient to form five seahs of cinders and on sabbath as much as he thought would make eight seas of cinders because from there they used to take fire for the two dishes of frankincense for the shoe bread the limbs and the pieces of fat which had not been consumed overnight were put back on the wood which had been laid they then kindled the two fires and descended and went to the chamber of hewn stone Gamara said Robert, this is an exaggeration. Similarly with regard to the statement they made the beast for the daily offering drink from the gold cup Rabbah said this is an exaggeration or am I said the Torah used hyperbole the prophets used hyperbole the sages used hyperbole the Torah used hyperbole as where it is written the cities are great and fortified up to heaven up to heaven thank you no but it is an exaggeration the sages used hyperbole in the cases we have just mentioned the heap and the giving the sacrifice beast to drink from a gold cup the prophets used hyperbole as it is written and the people piped with pipes so that the earth rent with the sound of the Marjan Abinaman he said in the name of Samuel in three places the sages used the language of hyperbole namely in connection with the heap divine and the veil this excludes the case cited by Rabbah where we have learned they made the beast for the daily sacrifice drink from the gold cup and Rabbah said this is an exaggeration this teaches us that this is true of it. Other cases but not of this one because in the abode of wealth no sign of poverty is allowed the exaggeration in the case of the heap is as stated in the case of the wine it is as has been taught a gold vine used to stand at the door of the inner temple trailed on poles and anyone who offered a leaf Talmud, must name it be or a single grape or a cluster used to bring it and hang it thereon said our Eliezer son of Arzadik on one occasion 300 priests were commissioned to clear it the case. Of the veil as has been taught we have learned our Simeon B. Gamaliel says the thickness of the veil was a hand breadth it was formed of 72 strands and each was made up of 24 threads its length was 40 cubits and its breadth was 20 cubits and it was made by 82 young girls and two were made every year and it took 300 priests to immerse it they began to take up the logs to lay the fire except vine and olive wood why were these accepted our papa said because they have not Sarah Habi Jacob said because of the amenities of the land of Israel the following was cited in objection to our papa upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar this implies wood which rapidly becomes fire which kind is that thin boughs like spits which do not form knots that is that do not become knotted inwardly are all kinds of wood suitable for the altar fire all kinds are suitable except olive and vine but what were mostly used were boughs of fig trees and nut trees and oil trees are Eliezer adds is not suitable also wood from the Midish and the oak and the date tree and the carob and sycamore there is no difficulty here for the one who says that it is because they are knotted the difference according
ordered that they might kindle the brushwood from there. The following was cited in objection to the latter opinion. Spaces were left between the logs in which they kindled the brushwood. He can reply brushwood was put in several places. C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I-I mission. The superintendent then said to them, come and cast lots to see who is to slaughter the animal and who is to sprinkle the blood and who is to clear the ashes from the inner altar and who is to clear the ash from the candlestick and who is to lift the limbs onto the descent, namely the head, the right leg, the breast, and the neck, and the two flanks with the entrails, also the fine flour and the griddle cakes and the wine they cast lots, and one or other was successful. He then said to them, Go out and see if it is yet time for the slaughter. If it actually was time, the observer said, There are flashes. Matthew B. Samuel says he used to say, The whole of the east of the sky has lit up. They would ask as far as Hebron and he did. Observer would answer, Yes, he said to them, Go out and bring a lamb from the lamb's chamber. Now the lamb's chamber was in the northwestern corner. There were four chambers there the lamb's chamber, the chamber of the seals, the chamber of the fire room, and the chamber where the shoe bread was prepared. They went into the chamber of the vessels and brought out from there ninety three vessels of silver and gold. They gave the animal for the daily sacrifice a drink from a cup Talmud, Moss tamed be of gold. Although it had been examined on the previous evening, it was now examined again by torchlight. Those on whom the lot had fallen to clear the ash from the inner altar and from the candlestick went on in front with four vessels in their hands, the tenny and the cuz and two keys. The tenny resembled a turk of gold and held two kbs and a half because resembled a large gold pitcher. With one of the two keys, he had to reach down as far as his armpit, and with the other, he opened in front of him. He then came to the small door on the north. The great gate had two small wickets, let in one on the north and one on the south. No one ever went in by the door on the south in accordance with the distinct statement in Ezekiel, namely, and the Lord said unto me, This gate shall be closed; it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. He took the key and opened the small door and went into the apartment and from the apartment to the hall which he traversed. Until he reached the great gate, when he reached the great gate, he drew back the bolt and the latches and opened it. The slaughterer did not kill till he heard the sound of the great gate being opened from Jericho. They heard the sound of the great gate being opened from Jericho. They heard the sound of the shovel from Jericho. They heard the sound of the singing of the Levites from Jericho. They used to hear the sound of Ben Arza clashing the cymbals from Jericho. They used to hear the sound of it. Pipes from Jericho. They could hear the voice of Gabon the herald from Jericho. They heard the noise of the wooden pulley which Ben had made for the labor from Jericho. They heard the sound of the singing of the Levites from Jericho. They heard the sound of the shofar. Some say also of the high priest when he pronounced the divine name on the day of atonement from Jericho. They could smell the odor of the compounding of incense. Arlaz or Bidikli said, My father had some goats in the towns of. My bar and they used to sneeze from the smell of the incense. The priest who had been chosen to kill the daily offering took it along with him to the slaughterhouse, accompanied by those who had been chosen to hand up the limbs. The slaughterhouse was to the north of the altar by it were eight dwarf pillars on top of which were blocks of cedar wood in which were fixed hooks of iron. Three rows in each the animals were hung on these and flayed over tables of marble between the pillars. The one who had been chosen for clearing the inner altar went in carrying the tenny which he set down in front of it and he scooped up the ash in his fist and put it inside and in the end he swept up what was left into it and then he left it there and went out. The one who had been chosen to clear the candlestick went in and if he found the two western lights burning he cleared the ash from the rest and left these two burning. If he found that these two had gone out he cleared away their ash and kindled them. From those which were still alight, and then he cleared the ash from the rest. There was a stone in front of the candlestick with three steps on which the priest stood in order to trim the lights. He left the cuz on the second step and went out. Chapterib mission. They did not use to tie up the lamb, but they strung its legs together. Those on whom the lot fell for the limbs took hold of it. It was strung up in such a way that its head was to the south, while its face was turned to the west. And the slaughterer stood to the east of it with his face turned to the west. The morning sacrifice was killed by the northwestern corner of the altar at the second ring, while the evening sacrifice was killed by the northeastern corner at the second ring. While one slaughtered another, received the blood. The latter proceeded to the northeastern corner and cast the blood on the eastern and northern sides. He then proceeded to the southwestern corner and cast the blood on the western and southern. Sides the remnant of the blood he poured out at the southern base of the altar Talmud, Moss tamed it he did not use to break the leg but he made a hole in it at the joint and suspended it from there he then began to flay it and went on until he came to the breast when he came to the breast he cut off the head and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen he then cut off the legs and gave them to the one to whose lot they had fallen on completing the flaying he tore out the heart and squeezed out the blood in it he then cut off the four legs and gave them to the one to whose lot they had fallen he then went back to the right leg and cut it off and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen and the two testicles with it he then tore open the carcass so that it was all exposed before him he took the fat and put it on top of the place where the head had been severed he took the innards and gave them to the one to whose lot they had fallen to wash them the stomach was washed very thoroughly in the washing chamber while the entrails were washed at least three times on marble tables which stood between the pillars he then took a knife and separated the lung from the liver and the finger of the liver from the liver but without removing it from its place he hollowed out the breast and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen he came to the right flank and cut into it as far as the spine without however touching the spine until he came to the place between two small ribs he cut it off and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen with the liver attached to it he then came to the neck and leaving two ribs on each side of it he cut it off and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen with the windpipe and the heart and the lung attached to it he then came to the left flank in which he left two thin ribs above and two thin ribs below and he had done similarly with the other flank thus he left two on each side above and two on each side below he Cut it off and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen and the spine with it and the milt attached to it. This was really the largest piece, but the right flank was called the largest because the liver was attached to it. He then came to the tailbone, which he cut off and gave to the one to whose lot it had fallen, along with the tail, the finger of the liver, and the two kidneys. He then took the left leg and cut it off and gave it to the one to whose lot it had fallen. By this time they were all standing in a row with the limbs in their hands. Talmud, Moss tamed it be the first head, the head and the right hind leg. The head was in his right hand with its nose towards his arm, its horns between his fingers, and the place where it was severed turned upwards with the fat covering it. The right leg was in his left hand with the place where the flame commenced away from him. The second had the two four legs, the right leg in his right hand, and the left leg in his left hand, the place where the Flame commenced being turned away from him. The third had the tailbone and the other hind leg. The tailbone in his right hand with the tail hanging between his fingers and the finger of the liver and the two kidneys with it and the left hind leg in his left hand with the place where the flame commenced away from him. The fourth had the breast and the neck. The breast in his right hand and the neck in his left hand. Its ribs being between two of his fingers. The fifth had the two flanks. The right one in his right hand and the left one in his left hand with the place where the flame commenced away from him. The sixth had the innards on a platter with the knees on top of them. The seventh had the fine flour. The eighth the griddle cakes. The ninth the wine. They went and placed them on the lower half of the descent on its western side and salted them and came down and went to the chamber of hewn stone to recite the Shemagmar. One taught the foreleg and the hind leg tied together. Like the binding of Isaac the son of Abraham, they did not tie up the lamb. What was the reason Arhuna and Arhista gave different answers? One said it was to avoid showing disrespect to holy things, while the other said it was to avoid walking in the statutes of the other peoples. What practical difference is there between them in the case where it was tied with silk or with gold thread? We have learned elsewhere there were thirteen tables in the temple, there were eight of marble in the slaughter. House on which they used to wash the innards, two to the west of the ascent, one of marble and one of silver on the marble one they used to put the limbs and on the silver one vessels of service, two in the porch on the inner side by the door of the sanctuary, one of silver and one of gold on the silver one they used to place the shoe bread when it was first brought in and on the gold one when it was taken out, because with
In the middle of the sky no one can look at it. The sages however say the distance in both cases is the same as it says for as the heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy towards them that fear him as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now if one of these distances is greater the text should not write both but only the one which is the greater what then is the reason why no one can look at the sun when it is in the middle of it. Sky because it is absolutely clear and nothing obstructs the view he said to them were heavens created first or the earth they replied the heavens were created first as it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth he said to them was light created first or darkness they replied this question cannot be solved why did they not reply that darkness was created first since it is written now the earth was unformed and void and darkness and after that and God said let there be light. And there was light they thought to themselves perhaps he will go on to ask what is above and what is below what is before and what is after if that is the case they should not have answered his question about the heaven either at first they thought that he just happened to ask that question but when they saw that he pursued the same subject they bethought themselves not to answer him lest he should go on to ask what was above and what was below what was before and what was after he said to them who is called wise they replied who is wise he who discerns what is about to come to pass he said to them who is called a mighty man they replied who is a mighty man he who subdues his evil passions he said to them who is called a rich man they replied who is rich he who rejoices in his lot he said to them what shall a man do to live they replied let him mortify himself what should a man do to kill himself they replied let him keep himself alive he said to them what should a man do to make himself popular they replied let him hate sovereignty and authority he said to them i have a better answer than yours let him love sovereignty and authority and confer favors on mankind he said to them is it better to dwell on sea or on dry land they replied it is better to dwell on dry land because those who set out to sea are never free from anxiety till they reach dry land again he said to them which among you is the wisest they replied we are all equal because we have all concurred in it same answers to your questions he said to them why do you resist me they replied the satan is too powerful he said to them behold i will slay you by royal decree they replied power is in the hands of the king but it beseems not a king to be false forth with he clothed them with garments of purple and put chains of gold on their necks he said to them i want to go to the country of africa they said to him you cannot get there because the mountains of darkness are in the way he said to them that Will not stop me from going was it for that I ask you but tell me what I am to do they said to him take Libyan asses that can travel in the dark and take coils of rope and fix them at the side of the road so that when you return you can guide yourself by them and reach your destination he did so and set forth he came to a place where there were only women he wanted to make war with them but they said to him if you slay us people will say that he killed women and if we slay you they will call you the king who was killed by women he said to them bring me bread they brought him gold bread on a gold table Talmud Moss Tamid B he said to them do people here eat gold bread they replied if you wanted bread had you no bread in your own place to eat that you should have journeyed here when he left the place he wrote on the gate of the city I Alexander of Macedon was a fool until I came to the city of women in Africa and I learned counsel from the women as he was journeying he sat by well and began to eat he had with him some salted fish and as they were being washed they gave off a sweet odor he said this shows that this well comes from the garden of Eden some say that he took some of the water and washed his face with it others say that he went alongside of it until he came to the door of the garden of Eden he cried out open the door for me they replied this is the gate of the Lord the righteous shall enter into it he replied I too am king I am also of some account give me something they gave him an eyeball he went and weighed all his silver and gold against it and it was not equal to it he said to the rabbis how is this they replied it is the eyeball of a human being which is never satisfied he said to them how can you prove that this is so they took a little dust and covered it and immediately it was weighed down and so it is written the nether world and destruction are never satiated so the eyes of man are never satiated the tenet of Eliyahu. Taught Gehenim is above the firmament some however say that is behind the mountains of darkness are high taught if one studies the Torah at night the divine presence faces him as it says arise cry out in the night at the beginning of the washes pour out thy heart like water before the face of the Lord are Eliezer be as Arias said the disciples of the wise increase peace in the world as it says and all that children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children read not. Benayik thy children but Bonayik thy builder C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V mission of the superintendent said to them pronounce one blessing and they did so they then recited the ten commandments and the first second and third sections of the Shema and they blessed the people with three benedictines namely true and firm and Abodah and the priestly benediction on Sabbath they added a benediction to be said by the watch which was leaving Mishnah he said to them those who are fresh to the incense come in. Draw lots and one or other was successful he then said new and old come and draw lots to see who shall take up the limbs from the ascent to the altar Ariel Israel B. Jacob says the one who lifts the limbs onto the ascent also takes them up to the altar Mishnah he then handed them over to the attendants who stripped them of their garments leaving on them only the bridges there were windows there on which was inscribed the name of the garment to which each was assigned Mishnah the one who had been selected to offer the incense took up the spoon which was in shape like a big turkab of gold it held three kbs and a small dish was in the middle of it talmud Moss tamed it heaped up with incense this had a covering over which was spread a kind of jacket Mishnah the one who had been assigned the shoveling took the silver fire pan and ascended to the top of the altar and cleared away the live coals to the side and that and swept away some of the ash at the bottom and then went down and Emptied them into a gold fire pan about a cab of the coals was spilled and these he swept into the sewer on Sabbath he used to put an overturned pot on them this pot was a large vessel holding a leaf it had two chains with one he used to draw it down and with the other he used to hold it above so that it should not roll over it was used for three purposes for placing over live coals and over a dead creeping thing on Sabbath and for drawing down the ashes from the top of the altar Misha. When they came between the porch and the altar one took the shovel and threw it between the porch and the altar people could not hear one another speak in Jerusalem from the noise of the shovel it served three purposes when a priest heard the sound of it he knew that his brother priests were going in to prostrate themselves and he would run to join them when a LEDL heard the noise of it he knew that his brother Levites were going in to chant and he would run to join them and the head of it. My AMAD used to make the unclean stand in the east gate C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V I mission they commenced to ascend the steps of the porch those who had been chosen to clear the ashes from the inner altar and from the candlestick LED the way the one who had been chosen to clear the inner altar went in and took the tenny and prostrated himself and went out again the one who had been chosen to clear the candlestick went in and if he found the two western lights still burning he cleared out the eastern one and left the western one burning since from it he lit the candlestick for the evening if he found that this one had gone out he cleared the ash away and lit it from the altar of burnt offering he then took the cuss from the second step and prostrated himself and went out mission the one who had been chosen for the fire pan made a heap of the cinders on the top of the altar and then spread them about with the end of the fire pan and prostrated himself and went out mission the one who had been Chosen for the incense to okay the dish from the middle of the spoon and gave it to his friend or his relative if some of it was spilled into the spoon he would put it into his hands they used to instruct him saying be careful not to begin immediately in front of you or else you may burn yourself he then commenced to scatter the incense and after finishing went out the one who burnt the incense did not do so until the superintendent said to him burn the incense if it was the high priest who burnt. He would say to him sir pray burn the incense the people left and he burnt the sense and prostrated himself and went out C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I Mishnah Talmud. Moss Tamid B when the high priest went in to prostrate himself three priests supported him one by his right and one by his left and one by the precious stones when the superintendent heard the sound of the footsteps of the high priest as he was about to issue from the hikal he raised the curtain for him he went and prostrated himself and Went out and then his brother priests went in and prostrated themselves and went out mission they went and stood on the steps of the porch the first set stood at the south side of their brother priests holding five vessels one held the tenny a second because a third the fire pan a fourth the dish and the fifth the spoon and its covering they blessed the people with a single benediction in the country they recited it as three blessings in the sanctuary as one in the temple they pronounced it divine name as it is written but in the country by its substitute in the country the priests raised their hands as high
Priests on the table of the fat with two trumpets in their hands, they blew a teikia, teru, and a teikia, and then went and stood by Ben Arza, one on his right hand and one on his left. When he bent down to make the oblation, the deputy high priest waved the flags, and Ben Arza struck the symbols, and the LEDLs chanted the song. When they came to a pause, a teru was blown, and the public prostrated themselves. At every pause, there was a teikia, and at every teikia, a prostra. On this was the order of the regular daily sacrifice for the service of the house of our God. May it be God's will that it be built speedily in our days. Amen. Mission of the following are the psalms that were chanted in the temple on the first day. They used to say, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell teherel. And on the second day, they used to say, Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy Montal. And on the third day, they used to say, God standeth in. The congregation of God in the midst of the judges he judges on the fourth day they used to say O Lord thou God to whom vengeance fell and get thou God to whom vengeance fell and get shine forth on the fifth day they used to say sing aloud unto God our strength shout unto the God of Jacob on the sixth day they used to say the Lord reignet he is clothed in majesty the Lord is clothed he hath girded himself with strength on Sabbath they used to say a psalm a song for the Sabbath day a psalm a song for the time to come for the day that will be all Sabbath and rest for everlasting life Mishnah Mosmid the chapter Mishnah in three places priests keep watch in the temple in the chamber of Abdinus in the flash chamber and in the fire chamber the Levites keep watch in twenty one places five at the five gates of the temple mount four at its four corners on the inside five at the five gates of Ezra four at its four corners on the outside one at the offering chamber one at the chamber of the bell and one behind the place of the mercy seat mission the officer of the temple mount used to go round to every watch with lighted torches before him and if any watcher did not rise at his approach and say to him peace be to the supervisor of the temple mount it was obvious that he was asleep and he used to bell for him with his stick and he was also at liberty to burn his clothes and the others used to say what is the noise in Ezra it is the cry of a Levite who is being beaten and whose clothes are being burnt because he was asleep at his post our Eliezer B. Jacob said once they found my mother's brother asleep and they burnt his clothes mission there were five gates to the temple mount the two gates of Hulda on the south which were used both for entrance and exit the gate of Kippenis on the west which was used both for entrance and exit the gate of Tadai on the north which was not used by the public at all and the eastern gate over which was a representation of the palace of Susa and through which the high priest who burnt the red heifer and all who assisted with it used to go forth to the Mount of Olives Mishnah there were three gates in the Ezra three in the north and three in the south and one in the east in the south there was first the gate of kindling then the gate of offering then the water gate in the east there was the gate of Nicanor which had two rooms attached one on its right and one on its left one the room of Phineas the dresser and one the room of the griddle cake makers mission on the north was the gate of the flash which was shaped like a veranda it had an upper chamber built on it and the priests used to keep watch above and the Levites below and it had a door opening into the hell next to it was the gate of offering and next to that the fire chamber mission there were four side chambers to the fire room like alcoves opening into a hall two in sacred ground and two in non sacred and there was a row of stones Separating the holy from the profane for what were they used the one on the southwest was the chamber of offering the one on the southeast was the chamber of the shewbread and the one to the northeast the Hasmoneans deposited the stones of the altar which the kings of Greece had defiled through the one on the northwest they used to go down to the bathing place mission of the fire room had two gates one opening onto the hell and one onto the Ezra Judah says the one that opened onto the Ezra had a small lattice gate through which they went in to search the Ezra mission of the fire room was vaulted it was a large room surrounded with stone slabs on these the elders of the father's house on duty used to sleep having with them the keys of the Ezra while the priestly novitiate slept each on his garment on the ground mission there was a place there one cubit square on which was a slab of marble and this was fixed a ring and a chain underneath on which the keys were hung. When closing time came the priest would raise the slab by the ring and take the keys from the chain then the priest would lock up within while the Levite was sleeping without when he had finished locking up he would replace the keys on the chain and the slab in its place and lay his garment on it and sleep there if a seminal emission happened to one of them he would go out by the winding stair which went under the fire and which was lighted with lamps on both sides until he reached the bathing. Place our Eliezer B. Jacob says he descended by the winding stair which went under the hell and he went out by the Tadai gate Mishnah. Mosmid the chapter Mishnah the temple mount was 500 cubits by 500 the greater part of it was on the south next to that on the east next to that on the north and the smallest part on the west the part which was most extensive was the part most used Mishnah all who entered the temple mount entered by the right and went round to the right end. Went out by the left save for one to whom something untoward had happened who entered and went round to the left if he was asked why do you go round to the left and he answered because I am a mourner they said to him may he who dwells in this house comfort thee if he said because I am excommunicated they said may he who dwells in this house inspire them to befriend thee again so our mayor said our Jose to him you make it seem that they treated him unjustly what then should they say may he who dwells in this house inspire thee to listen to the words of thy colleagues so that they may befriend thee again mission within it was the sorry ten handbreadths high there were thirteen breaches in it these had been originally made by the kings of Greece and when they repaired them they enacted that thirteen prostrations should be made facing them within this was the hell which was ten cubits broad there were twelve steps there the height of each step was half a cubit and its tread was Half a cubit all the steps in the temple were half a cubit high with a tread of half a cubit except those of the porch all the doorways in the temple were twenty cubits high and ten cubits broad except those of the porch all the doorways there had doors in them except those of the porch all the gates there had lintels except that of Tadai which had two stones inclined to one another all the original gates were changed for gates of gold except the gates of Nicanor because a miracle was wrought. To them some say however it was because the copper of them gleamed like gold mission all the walls of the temple were high except the eastern wall so that the priest who burnt the red heifer might while standing on the top of the Mount of Olives by directing his gaze carefully see the door of the Hikal at the time of the sprinkling of the blood mission of the women's Ezra was a hundred and thirty-five cubits long by a hundred and thirty-five broad it had four chambers in its four corners. Each of forty cubits they were not roofed and so they will be in the time to come as it says then he brought me forth into the outer court and caused me to pass by the four corners of the court and behold in every corner of the court there was a court in the four corners of the court there were smoke courts and smoke means only that they were not roofed for what were they used the southeastern one was the chamber of the Nazirites where the Nazirites used to boil their peace offerings and pull their hair and throw it under the pot the northeastern one was the wood chamber where priests with a physical defect used to pick out the wood which had worms every piece with a worm in it being unfit for use on the altar the northwestern one was the chamber of the lepers as for the southwestern one a Eliezer B. Jacob said I forget what it was used for Abyssal says they used to store their wine and oil and it was called the oil storage room at the women's Ezra had originally been quite Bear, but subsequently they surrounded it with a balcony so that the women could look on from above while the men were below and they should not mix together fifteen steps led up from it to the Ezra of Israel corresponding to the fifteen songs of ascents mentioned in the book of Psalms the Levites used to chant psalms on these they were not rectangular but circular like the half of a threshing floor Mishnah there were chambers underneath the court of Israel which opened into the court of women where the Levites used to keep lyres and lutes and cymbals and all kinds of musical instruments the court of Israel was a hundred and thirty five cubits in length by eleven in breadth similarly the court of the priests was a hundred and thirty five cubits in length by eleven in breadth and a row of stones separated the court of Israel from the court of the priests a Eliezer B. Jacob says there was a step a cubit high on which was placed a platform and this had three steps each of half a Cubit in this way the court of the priests was made two and a half cubits higher than that of Israel the whole of Ezra was a hundred and eighty seven cubits in length by a hundred and thirty five in breadth and thirteen prostrations were made there Abba Jose Behanan says they were made facing thirteen gates on the south adjoining the west there were the upper gate the gate of
allowed for the priests to go round thus leaving 24 by 24 as a place of the wood pile for the altar fire our Jose said originally the complete area occupied by the altar was only 28 cubits by 28 and it rose with the dimensions mentioned until the space left for the altar pile was only 20 by 20 when however they returned from the captivity they added 4 cubits on the north and 4 on the west like a gamma since it is said and the heart shall be 12 cubits long by 12 broad square am I to suppose that it was only 12 cubits by 12 when it says in the four sides thereof this shows that he was measuring from the middle 12 cubits in every direction a line of red paint ran round it in the middle to divide between the upper and the lower blood the foundation ran the whole length of the north and of the west sides but it left open one cubit on the south and one on the east mission at the southwestern corner of it foundation there were two openings like two fine nostrils through which the blood which was poured on the western side of the foundation and on the southern side flowed down till the two streams became mingled in the channel through which they made their way out to the brook of Kidron mission on the pavement beneath at that corner there was a place a cubit square on which was a marble slab with a ring fixed in it and through this they used to go down to the pit to clean it out there was an ascent on the south side of the altar 32 cubits long by 16 broad it had a cavity in its western side where rejected sin offerings of birds were placed mission of the stones both of the ascent and of the altar were taken from the valley of beth Karim. they dug into virgin soil and brought from their whole stones on which no iron had been lifted since iron disqualifies by mere touch though a scratch made by anything could disqualify if one of them received a scratch it was Disqualified, but the rest were not. They were whitewashed twice a year, once at Passover and once at Tabernacles, and the call was whitewashed once a year at Passover. Rabbi says they were whitewashed every Friday with a cloth on account of the blood stains. The plaster was not laid on with a trowel of iron for fear that it might touch and disqualify, since iron was created to shorten man's days, and the altar was created to prolong man's days, and it is not right, therefore, that that which shortens should be lifted against that which prolongs mission. There were rings to the north of the altar, six rows of four each, or according to some four rows of six each, at which they used to slaughter the sacrificial animals. The slaughterer's shed was at the north of the altar. There were eight dwarf pillars there on which were blocks of cedar wood, and these were fixed hooks of iron, three rows in each, on which they hung the carcasses and flayed them over tables of marble between the pillars. Mission of it. Labor was between the porch and the altar a little to the south. The space between the porch and the altar was 22 cubits. There were 12 steps there, each step being half a cubit high and a cubit broad. There was a cubit, a cubit, and a level space of three cubits, and a cubit, a cubit, and a level space of three cubits, and at the top a cubit, a cubit, and a level space of four cubits. Our Judah says that at the top there was a cubit, a cubit, and a level space of five cubits. Mission of the doorway of the porch was 40 cubits high, and its breadth was 20 cubits. Over it were five main beams of cedar. The lowest projected a cubit on each side beyond the doorway. The one above projected beyond this one a cubit on each side. Thus the topmost one was 30 cubits long. There was a layer of stones between each one and the next mission. There were crossbars of stone stretching from the wall of the call to the wall of the porch to prevent it from bulging. There were chains of gold fixed in it. Roof beams of the porch by which the priestly novitiates used to ascend and see the crowns as it says and the crowns shall be to Helam and to Tobijah and to Jedeah and to Han the son of Zephaniah as a memorial in the temple of the Lord a golden vine stood at the door of the call trained on poles and anyone who offered a leaf or a grape or a bunch used to bring it and hang it thereon our Eliezer son of Arzadik said on one occasion three hundred priests were commissioned to clear it Misha. Mosmidoth chapter Misha the doorway of the call was twenty cubits high and ten broad it had four doors two on the inner side and two on the outer as it says and the temple and the sanctuary had two doors the outer ones opened into the interior of the doorway so as to cover the thickness of the wall while the inner ones opened into the temple so as to cover the space behind the doors because the whole of the temple was overlaid with gold except the space behind the doors our Judah says it. Doors were placed within the doorway and they resembled folding doors one half covering two cubits and a half of the wall and the other half covering two cubits and a half leaving half a cubit and a door post at the one end and half a cubit and a door post at the other end as it says and the doors had two leaves apiece two turning leaves two leaves for the one door and two leaves for the other mission of the great gate had two wickets one to the north and one to the south by the one to the south. No man ever went in and concerning this the rule was distinctly laid down by the mouth of Ezekiel as it says and the Lord said unto me this gate shall be shut it shall not be opened neither shall any man enter in by it for the Lord God of Israel hath entered in by it therefore it shall be shut he the priest took the key and opened the northern wicket and went into the cell and from the cell he went into the call Arjuda says he used to walk along in the thickness of the wall until he Came to the space between the two gates he used to open the outer doors from within and the inner doors from without Mishnah there were 38 cells there 15 on the north 15 on the south and 8 on the west on the north and on the south there were 5 over 5 and 5 again over these on the west there were 3 over 3 and 2 over these each had 3 openings 1 to the cell on the right and 1 to the cell on the left and 1 to the cell above in the one at the northeastern corner there were 5 openings 1 to the cell on the RLGHT 1 to the cell above 1 to the mezzabah 1 to the wicket and 1 to the Ekal Mishnah the lowest story chamber was 5 cubits wide with a ceiling of 6 cubits the middle story chamber was 6 cubits wide with a ceiling of 7 the top story chamber was 7 cubits wide as it says the nethermost story of the side structure was 5 cubits broad and the middle was 6 cubits broad and the third was 7 cubits Broad Mishnah a winding passage went up from the northeast corner to the northwest corner by which they used to mount to the roofs of the cells one ascended the passage facing the west and traversed the whole of the northern side till he reached the west when he reached the west he turned to face south he then traversed the west side till he reached the south when he reached the south he turned to face eastwards he then traversed the south side till he reached the door of the upper chamber. Since the door of the upper chamber opened to the south in the doorway of the upper chamber were two columns of cedar by which they used to climb up to the roof of the upper chamber and at the top of them was a row of stones showing the division in the upper chamber between the holy part and the holy of holies there were trapdoors in the upper chamber opening into the holy of holies by which the workmen were let down in baskets so that they should not feed their gaze on the holy of holies. Mission of Akal was a hundred cubits by a hundred with a height of a hundred the substructure was six cubits then it rose forty then a cubit for the ornamentation two cubits for the guttering a cubit for the roof and a cubit for the plastering the height of the upper chamber was forty cubits there was a cubit for its ornamentation two cubits for the guttering a cubit for the ceiling a cubit for the plastering three cubits for the parapet and a cubit for the spikes our Judah says the spikes were not included in the measurement the parapet being four cubits mission from east to west was a hundred cubits the wall of the porch five cubits the porch itself eleven the wall of Akal six cubits and its interior forty a cubit for the partition and twenty cubits for the holy of holies the wall of Akal six cubits the cell six cubits and the wall of the cell five from north to south was seventy cubits the wall of the mezzah five cubits the mezzah itself three the wall of it Cell 5 and the cell itself 6 the wall of the call 6 cubits and its interior 20 then the wall of the call again 6 and the cell 6 and its wall 5 then the place of the water descent 3 cubits and its wall 5 cubits the porch extended beyond this 15 cubits on the north and 15 cubits on the south and the space was called the night house where they used to store the slaughterers knives thus the call was narrow behind and brought in front resembling a lion is it says Ariel Ariel the city where David encamped just as a lion is narrow behind and brought in front so the call was narrow behind and brought in front Misha Mosmito chapter Misha Mosmito chapter Misha the whole of Ezra was 887 cubits long by 835 brought from east to west it was 887 the space to which the Israelites had access was 11 cubits the space to which the priests had access was 11 cubits the altar took up 32 between the porch and the altar was 22 cubits. The call took up 800 cubits and there were 11 cubits behind the mercy seat. Mission from north to south was 835 cubits. The ascent and the altar took up 62 from the
Over it and from there water was provided for all the Ezra in the chamber of Hewn Stone the great Sanhedrin of Israel used to sit and judge among other things that applicants for priesthood a priest in whom was found a disqualification used to put on black undergarments and wrap himself in black and clear away one in whom no disqualification was found used to put on white undergarments and wrap himself in white and go in and minister along with his brother priests they used to make a feast. Because no blemish had been found in the seat of Aaron the priest and they used to say thus blessed is the omnipresent blessed is he because no blemish has been found in the seat of Aaron blessed is he who chose Aaron and his sons to stand to minister before the Lord in the Holy of Holies.